Hey everybody, tonight we're debating whether or not the Bible is pro-slavery and we are starting right now with Aaron's opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us again, Aaron. The floor is all yours. Thank you. Asking whether the Bible is pro-slavery allows three options, pro, con, or neutral. The mere fallible people who wrote the sacred scriptures should have or could have taken a neutral position, uh, choosing not to comment on slavery at all. But we know that the Bible does talk about slavery a lot, and everything it says about it permits the practice to continue in all its forms, as if approved by God. Otherwise, the Bible could uh, could either condemn slavery, which it never does, or advocate for it, saying that it's okay, you can do that, which it actually does do. Leviticus 25 is an example of the Bible being pro-slavery, saying that you may have slaves, male and female. You have God's permission to do that. And now later in the same chapter, it says that the Hebrew people are not allowed to capture prisoners to make them into slaves, that instead, God says that you shall buy them from the strangers who sojourn among you. Although there is a later provision that refugees captured in wartime will become your slaves too. Either way, it's still pro-slavery. And this is a problem for those who don't have an objective standard of morality, no criteria by which to determine whether something is or isn't moral, like the universal understanding that a particular action or choice is immoral or wrong if it somehow diminishes happiness, well-being, or health, or if it somehow causes unnecessary harm or suffering or both. Those who rely on authority rather than reason have no reason by which to determine what is or is not moral. So. They have to turn to some alleged prophet pretending to speak for their God to tell them what is or isn't moral and never explain to them why it is or isn't. And consequently, here we have the Hebrew God saying that it's okay to have slaves, that you may buy them from foreigners and even buy their children and keep them all as slaves for life. And God says that that's all fine and dandy and neither Jehovah nor Jesus ever say otherwise anywhere. And this is what led Confederate President Jefferson Davis to conclude that slavery was established by decree of Almighty God, that it is sanctioned in the Bible in both Testaments from Genesis to Revelation. So there was a missed opportunity here. The Bible could have condemned slavery, and it would have had it not been written by slavers. It should have explicitly stated that it is a sin or an abomination or otherwise forbidden for one person to own another, the same type of prohibition the Bible gives for so many other things. The Bible says that it's an abomination to eat shellfish or to mix wool and linen in the same garment, that it is a violation of the Ten Commandments to boil a baby goat in its own mother's milk or to kill another person, unless you're sacrificing disobedient children or you have to murder your brother for believing in other gods. And it's a sin to be angry or arrogant or conceited or lustful or to, or to work on the Sabbath or to be divorced and remarried. The Bible prohibits all of these things explicitly. But the so-called word of God somehow forgot to say, oh, by the way, it's also wrong or evil for one person to own another and to force the subservience of another as property. The Bible never says that, nor anything like that, neither in the Old Testament nor in the New. If it did say that somewhere, if there was some contradiction, like when the Bible says, thou shalt not kill, but then in the next chapter it says, kill every man and his brother, then my opponent might have a point to argue from. But this is one of those rare instances where the Bible does not contradict itself. It only ever advocates for slavery and never, ever challenges that institution on any grounds, not even morality. At best, we have that one line in Leviticus 25 that you may have slaves from other nations, but you must not rule over your fellow Israelites ruthlessly, implying that it's perfectly fine to abuse foreign slaves as brutally as you like. Exodus 21 allows that you can even torture them if you want to. You just can't legally kill them or leave them physically disabled. But if they get up after a couple of days, then it doesn't matter because they are your property, not their own. And remember that you can only do that with foreign slaves, not with Hebrew slaves, the Israelites, because it says that those slaves should be afforded more rights than the slaves of other ethnicities get. However, even they can still be bought and sold and forced into servitude by virtually anyone even other Hebrews. And sure, Exodus is supposed to be all about freeing the slaves, but it's only talking about a particular group of Hebrew slaves, the ones being held en masse by the Egyptian government. But even in that same chapter, it still allows that Hebrews may keep other Hebrews as slaves. 
And just as Numbers 5 expressly allows abortion with God's approval and assistance, explaining the particulars for how that is to be done and never makes any prohibition against that, so too do both the Old and New Testaments give their God's permission for slavery along with his guidelines for how that is to be done and how the slaves are supposed to honor God in service to their masters. Even Jesus said that, that slaves should obey their masters in fear. The same way they would obey Christ, as if they were slaves to Christ. So instead of condemning Christian, or get him, instead of condemning slavery, Jesus expresses how he himself is pro-slavery, and that Christianity is pro-slavery. Which is why we have to assume a slave's position on our knees, heads down, with hands clasped, as if bound. Even when God is playing these games with Pharaoh and hardening Pharaoh's hearts just to keep the game going and prolong everyone's suffering unnecessarily, when God tells Moses, these are the laws that you are to set before them, the very first one specifically gives God's permission to buy and keep slaves. But just as God's laws say that the Jews may not charge interest on loans to other Jews, it also allows that Hebrews may buy and keep Hebrew slaves, but that those slaves have special privilege in that the Hebrew slaves must be set free after seven years. Unless the slave master uh, decides to breed male Hebrew slaves with his other stock, and then the slave falls in love with his new family because the master is not going to let his slave leave with his wife and kids. Not even if they're Hebrew too, because those slaves belong to the one who bought them, not the one who loves them or sired them. The only way the Hebrew slave can stay with his wife is if he gives up any chance at ever having freedom and is thus marked with an all through his ear to become like his wife and children in that all of them will be always slaves forever. And this is a good deal for the slave breeder because God's law says that female slaves may be bought at half the cost of a male. But then by keeping slave women as breed mares, the master can entice the now dependent Hebrew males into perpetual slavery too. And if that sounds immoral, it gets worse. Because the very next law, the second law purportedly given by God to Moses, allows that a man may sell his own daughter into sex trafficking. Even Hebrew girls don't get the same considerations as Hebrew males, because God's laws are not only racist, they're sexist as well. Now, if a man buys a slave girl as a mate for his son, although she has no right or ref of refusal or choice, no independent agency whatsoever, she would otherwise be treated as family rather than a slave, because that's as close as a girl in that culture could ever get to freedom. However, if a man buys a slave girl for himself to satisfy his own lust, but then he takes a test drive and decides that he doesn't like her, she doesn't please him as expected, then uh, he can't sell her to someone else because she is considered to be damaged. She's used and is thus only good to serve as a housemaid. He can marry other women at the same time because women had no rights then. All, all women in that culture were property of one sort or another. But if he does marry other women, he still has to feed and provide for that one. And he still has to have sex with her, too, because that's one of the few so-called rights that a slave in that culture had, even if it's not one that she wanted. Because if she doesn't please him and he doesn't want to bother with her anymore, he can't sell her to anyone else. But he can always set her free, which means kick her out into the wilderness unprotected, with no money or provisions, so that she will almost certainly be killed or enslaved by someone else shortly thereafter, and he's just out the ten shekels that he paid for. Because the Bible God not only permits, allows, and promotes slavery, God even set the price, such that the female slaves cost half as much as the men. It will always be ten shekels for a teenage girl, no matter what the exchange rate is, regardless of inflation and what the price of a bagel is. And it's funny that the Bible says that uh, lust is a sin, but that slavery isn't. Not even when it's the trafficking of children for sexual slavery. Because in Numbers 31, Moses, the lawgiver, commanded his troops to kill all the Median boy, uh, Medianite boys and uh, every woman who had slept with a man, but that they could keep all the virgins for themselves. The New American Standard Version refers to these captured and traumatized virgins as girls. The New Revised Standard calls them young girls. Well, the King James Version calls them women children, and Young's literal translation calls them infants. And since all of these refer to their young age as distinguished from adults, then these girls uh, would likely have been preteens, according to Jewish tradition of marking that distinction at 12 years old. 
In any case, it's clear we're talking about kids kept alive only because of the purity of their sex. With that as their only value to their masters, they are inarguably slaves without right of consent or refusal. So taking their virginity is merely a property right. And I've heard the argument that what the Bible calls slavery is not the same as chattel slavery practiced in the U.S. until 1865, that what happened in the Bible was only indentured servitude, like what Jacob in Genesis agreed to voluntarily, and thus would not really be slavery at all, in which case that some definition is in order. Although there are some subtleties to be considered, the simplest definition of slavery is when human beings may be bought and or sold as property to be owned by another person, considered to belong to their master, for whom they are forced to perform labor or other services, while they are also deprived of some, but not necessarily all, of the rights enjoyed by free persons. Within the parent definition, there are a number of subcategories. Bonded slavery is where someone is forced to labor until some debt or other arrangement is satisfied. And this is not like Jacob's voluntary arrangement in Genesis, but it could apply to the males among the Hebrew slaves, though not to the wives given to them by their masters. Leviticus 25 makes clear that they, the wives given to them, are in the category of chattel slaves who can be bought and sold and kept in servitude indefinitely. They are your property forever and may even be inherited by your sons so that they will always be slaves until they die. And this even applies to the children that these slaves produce together, that they will be born into slavery and will belong to their parents' masters until they die or get sold to someone else, regardless what their parents have to say about it. And there are other forms of debt slavery where wages are paid to the slave but are insufficient for the laborer to ever gain independence. And in this case, the trafficking of slaves might not be as obvious as standing them on an auction block, at least not a public one, but it's still effectively the same thing. And so is the enslavement of refugees and prisoners of war, which we see in the Bible quite often, either of which might be kept indefinitely for the purpose of forced labor or sexual submission. If the Bible promotes or condones any of these subcategories, then the Bible is pro-slavery. And as we've already seen, different areas of Scripture either promote or permit slavery in all its forms without condemnation or contradiction. Thank you very much for that opening statement, Aaron. And want to let you know, folks, if it's your first time here at Modern Day Debate, I am your host, James. Want to welcome you, no matter whether you be Christian, atheist, Muslim, you name it. We're glad that you're here. We hope you feel welcome. We are a neutral channel hosting debates on science, religion, and politics. And we've got to tell you, my dear friends, if you haven't seen at the bottom right of your screen, DebateCon 3.1 is our third conference we are putting on. It's going to be in Fort Worth, Texas in just three weeks on Saturday, April 22nd. You don't want to miss it. This is going to be epic. As an example, my dear friends, as you can see at the bottom right of your screen as well, Arn Ra and T Jump will be debating whether or not religion does more good than harm. You don't want to miss it, so check out the links in the description box. If you're near Fort Worth, there's a link for tickets, as well as maybe you're like, well, James, that's too far of a trip for me. I'm in Alaska or England, whatever it might be. We have a link for a crowd fund. It helps us cover the cost of the venue. If you put in a buck, you can watch the whole conference live from home. We hope to see you there, whether it be virtually or in person. So with that, we're going to kick it over to Converse Contender's opening statement. Thanks so much for being with us, Converse. The floor is all yours. All right, thanks. Is the Bible pro-slavery? Well, no. It's tempting to comment on some of the points that were just raised by Aaron, but I'll save that for my rebuttal and uh, get started here. So let me first uh, start by pointing out that, like, look, I agree that, like, Many, if not most, attempts by Christians to talk about this topic are at best lacking. Christians can be stubborn, reactionary, and traditionalist noted. But with that being said, to quote Quay, this just goes as much for non-believers. They have a chip on their shoulder about this topic, it seems. It's obviously a Cheeto because, you know, atheists are video game playing degenerates. Uh, but I digress. I've found myself in many conversations with atheists where they just want to claim that I'm a no-good slave apologist just for refuting claims that are clearly false. They love to gaslight and then complain about Christians gaslighting them, but it's, some are really actually quite open, so it's good to, to see that. Now, I think the problem is that it's a debate bro culture, but we can move past that. 
It's very difficult when you've studied a lot of scholarship on and, and read hundreds of pages. You've you've you want to cite over you know fifty or hundred verses, but you only have fifteen minutes to do so. So I'm going to have to talk quick. So uh, let me get into it and don't take it from me. Uh, you know, do your own research, please. I might be wrong. It won't be the first time. Uh, since Arne's taking the affirmative position, he will be taking on a burden of proof to show that his claims are true. Tonight, I will defend two basic positions. First, a fairly standard view that the Bible isn't pro-slavery, but instead the Bible shows a development away from the institution in the Old Covenant, which was as common as capitalism is now, and teaches a human ethic in the New Covenant that is incompatible with what we uh, call slavery. And second, somewhat more novel position that goes further, the data in the Bible uh, dealing with what people are calling slavery is uh, better understood as household adoption or marriage. But let's say that second claim can't stand up to scrutiny. The first position is all one needs. To get started, initially I was told that the scholars generally think that there was an ownership of chattel slaves in the ancient Near East, and I didn't say it can't be. Instead, I read the literature and took a position like some scholars, such as Jay Caballero, a Christian scholar of the ancient Near East who contributed to Dr. Josh's book. Um, the position is basically that it is true that the, in the uh, institution that was uh, is similar in ancient Israel, but Jesus fulfilled the law and showed us that some of the laws Moses gave the people were given because they were hard-hearted, and it wasn't like that from the beginning. So in Matthew chapter 19, the Pharisees tried to trap Christ by asking, is it lawful to divorce one's wife? He, Christ said that uh, God brings to, what God brings together, no one should separate. Then the Pharisees said, why did Moses command us to give a certificate of divorce to our wives? And, and Christ said, Said, because of the hardness of your heart, Moses allowed for divorce of your wives, but it was not so from the beginning. We see a principle that there were things allowed for in the legal tradition associated with Moses that weren't ideal, but specifically tolerated because of how barbaric the people were. The beginning is what the ideal life looks like. As people, as one family together, no separations, no divorces, no nations or structures, uh, etc., I think I could just leave it there, but I think Arn would probably ignore a lot of what I just said and ask me about a bunch of verses that he thinks aren't up to today's standards. Uh, but I need to, uh, as if I needed to defend those views. But to continue with this marriage motif and to adopt another motif, I will turn to my second claim. First, the Bible isn't a book. It's a library or a codex of literature ranging many authors over many centuries. When we begin to look at this collection, we have to have a meta narrative and a hermeneutical approach to actually see what the uh, the text is getting at. But because of how predictable some people are, I know they're going to say that some of the context is just irrelevant to the five or six verses they want to talk about. But to start from the beginning, God had a household prior to creation, um, the heavenly host. God created and ordered a chaotic deep, forming the earth in a place that is habitable for creation, free of disorder. The creature lived in communion with God, but broke uh, but br uh, brought back disorder, and they fell from God's presence, and now humans lose access to the source of immortality and have to survive. And God makes concessions for his creation for this reason throughout Scripture. For example, first God gave humans plants and fruit for, for food, but after the fall, God uh, allowed them to eat meat, uh, making concessions like this. God uh, is meeting people where they are. You can think about 1 Samuel 8, where the elders of Israel told Samuel to appoint them a king like the other nations had. Samuel was upset and prayed to God, and God said, look, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me as their king. They're serving other gods. Let's, you know, give them a king, but tell them what he's going to require to rule. And he, ta uh, he says, they'll, okay, um, that's fine, but he will take your sons and your daughters and make them serve. He will take your servants and make them serve. He will take you and eventually make you uh, serve him. Um, I want you to think about the most foundational stories in the Bible. After the Tower of Babel, uh, God separates the nations. In the next chapter, God says, okay, they don't want anything to do with me. I'll choose somebody and make a nation for myself. God chooses Abraham, and uh, he, who's the father of the, the Israelites. And tell him to leave your ancestors' homeland, your father's household, to the land I'll show you. 
God tells him uh, that he'll be a stranger in another land, doesn't even tell him where he's going, and Abraham keeps being called a foreigner and a sojourner. Then God makes a covenant with Abraham, says he'll bless all the nations of the world. He just disinherited the nations, but now Abraham is going to be the key to blessing all those nations. When Abraham didn't have any children, he said that, God, my servant will inherit my estate. All of his things would go to his servant if he passed. Let us look at a, another story. Abraham's grandson, Jacob, whom is the his name Israel comes from, is mistreated as a servant. Uh, and uh, when you look at what his wives say about their inheritance with their father, they say, uh, did we not, uh, you know, do we have any inheritance left in our father's estate? Does he not regard us as foreigners? We see the same thing in many other chapters. Let's look at one more um, foundational story. We have Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. The story God vindicates him by raising him through the ranks to become the vizier or second in charge only to Pharaoh in Egypt. And Joseph saved his brothers and countless others from a family. And, and Joseph's whole family were given an inheritance property in Akuzah in the best part of Egypt by the Pharaoh. It's like We get this concession language that uh, when Joseph's brothers realize, they cry and apologize to him. But he says, you brought this about for evil, but God brought it about for good. The found, uh, next foundational story, literally, they were enslaved in Egypt, being treated harshly. God redeemed them. Uh, you know, let my people go, you know, dozens of times that God repeats uh, Israelites uh, throughout the Bible. You should remember when you were slaves in Egypt and so forth. These stories are kind of important for the formation of their beliefs, the things they're supposed to remember. Most people I talk to don't realize that the slave, the, there was a slave Bible in the United States that cut out 90 percent of the Old Testament, 60 percent of the New Testament. I wonder why. But one detail I glossed over is that one of the most important uh, tools to understanding this, uh, why this is allowed for, is the Deuteronomy 32 worldview, as it's called. Most scholars are in Vega, uh, pretty much agree on this. Um, Deuteronomy 32 refers back to Babel, and it says that God separated the uh, children of uh, according to the, the the nations according to the number of the sons of God. All throughout the ancient Near East, you have the same. Um, narrative as well with the same number, 70. Israel uh, sacrifices 70 bulls at the uh, Feast of Boots. Uh, Christ sends out 70 apostles when uh, he's going to um, re to reclaim the nations. Now, I want you to read the books like uh, Unseen Realm. There is a um, underlying theme that uh, you can get uh, even up into the New Testament. Let's take a look at the book of Ruth, for example. Naomi moved to Moab because of a famine in Israel, so she, now she's a foreigner. Her sons married Moabite women, but they both died, and her husband died. When she's headed back, her uh, her, her daughter-in-law, who is a foreigner, says, I want to go with you. And she tells one of them, no, go back to your household and to your gods. And the first one left, but, but in Ruth in verse 15 says, no, your people will become my people, and your God will become my God. And um, after this, uh, Ruth has relinquished her gods and her household or national heritage. When she gets back, she does as poor as two people do. She cleans up behind the people reaping crops so she can eat, as Leviticus 23 prescribes. So she, um, when you reap your harvest, do not uh, get to the edges of the field, gather the gleanings for your harvest. Um, leave them for the poor and the foreigner residing among you, for I am the Lord your God. So um, Boaz comes out and helps her. And Ruth asks, why have I found favor with you? I'm a foreigner. And Boaz um, says, well, I heard what you did for your mother-in-law. You left your mother and father's house to a homeland of people you do not know, and you've come to take refuge under the wings of the God of Israel. She has become under God's protection now. She, she, has this, that, she says, I don't even have the status of one of your servants. Later, she's told her mother-in-law about what happened, and he, she says, oh, yeah, he's one of our guardian redeemers. So her mother-in-law says to basically, look, uh, go and uncover his feet, <laughs> which is uh, kind of an idiom, obviously. And uh, Boaz says, look, uh, I would love to, you know, to marry you, but uh, yeah, yeah, I can't do it because there's somebody that's a more close guardian redeemer than me. So he goes to the city and asks the guy, will you uh, redeem Naomi's property? And he says, yeah, I'll do it. And he goes, okay, but and then Boaz pulls this move where he's like, okay, cool, but uh, – Ruth the Moabitess, you know, the foreigner, she's attached to the household, so you're going to have to marry her as well. You're acquiring her, you know. And then he's like, uh, well, uh, no, then I'm good because why? What's his, what does he say? 
because if I do it, it will um, put my inheritance at jeopardy. So Boaz ends up marrying her anyway himself. Um, now let's look at uh, one more example of God condescending to settle a dispute. The daughters of Zelophehad comes to um, Moses and says uh, that their father had died in the wilderness before they got to the land. So why should their property go away just because they had no sons? She said, "They said, look, we're women, but why couldn't we get uh, property?" And and Moses and this is uh, um, Zelophehad's daughters are. Um, uh, Moses left. goes to God in prayer. Moses goes to God in prayer and says, uh, why can't we, you know, uh, they're asking for this property. And God says, what Zoph- Zelophehad's daughters are saying is right. You must certainly give them the property as an inheritance among their fathers and relatives as an inheritance to them. This is, and then the last line, this is to have the force of law for the Israelites uh, as the Lord commanded. All right, now let's look at a few notes. Uh, Milgram points out that there is another um, uh, in Deuteron- I mean, Leviticus chapter 28 that some people take it, such as Muff's um, li- uh, a marriage adoption formula, which is found in Exodus and Leviticus 20, Exodus 6, 7, Leviticus 26, 12. Laura Culbertson, the Slaves and Households, she says that, uh, uh, number one, that uh, there is no um, what we think of as slavery. She says that often their people, problem of the defining slavery is the appeal to the dichotomy versus slave versus free. Historians of the Near East history have reportedly pointed out the incapability of this polarity and One noted the idea left. of complete individual freedom was in fact known unknown in the modern world. So there was no individual freedom known in, in the pre-modern world. Christ said, blessed are the poor and the gentle. Whatever you do to the least of these, you also do to me. The last will be first, the first will be last. First Corinthians 7 is, were you a slave in your call? Don't let it trouble you. But uh, if you can, gain your freedom. For the one who is a slave when called to the faith of the Lord is a person. Similarly, the one who was free is called in Christ's slave. You are bought at a price. Don't become slaves to human beings. Uh, there's neither Jew, Jew nor Gentile free um, – um, uh, slave nor free, male nor female, you're all heirs according to the promise. For if the inheritance depended on the law, uh, it didn't depend on the promise, God's grace. Uh, I can't read this because of the thing over there, but basically says that uh, why then has the law been given? It was added because of transgressions. And then lastly, the, the last couple are just basically saying the adoption language. He says that we were adopted, we were redeemed. Um, we were adopted as sons into the family of Christ. And, and time. And so, We are going to jump into, tonight we have a little bit more of a, you could say a little bit more of a structured format. In particular, we're going to have an eight-minute rebuttal. This one coming in from Aaron, the floor is all yours. Oh, I think you might be on mute yet. Aaron, I think you might be on mute. Uh, Let me ask to unmute. There you go. All right, no worries. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not going to need much to rebut um, because there wasn't really anything to rebut. All the pretty pictures and irrelevant references failed to address any of the necessary points of this debate. Uh, My opponent neither uh, rebutted the reverses that advocate slavery nor presented anything to contradict them. And never did he present any statement of the Bible prohibiting slavery or the institution or condemning the institution of slavery. Though he alleged that there are parts of the slave Bible that cut out the parts about you know Hebrew slaves escaping Egypt and a few other places that that talked about how uh, the slaves might get redemption later on because of course in the United States they wanted to keep people oppressed but none of that uh, ever condemns the institution of slavery either. Uh, otherwise, there was a moment when he sort of implied that there are times when a master can decide that they like their servants either as family, friends, or perhaps as pets. And he presented one verse that was justifying slavery in this life on the impossible promise of a posthumous reward in the next life. So he didn't give me anything to work with. He didn't present anything relevant. My point stands unaddressed. We'll kick it over to Converse for his opening, or I should say eight-minute rebuttal as well. Converse, the floor is all yours. All right. Thanks, James. Yeah. So let's start where he ended. Uh, I didn't rebut his stuff in my opening. Well, it was one of the points that I made in the opening is that I want to do that, but I won't be doing that in my opening for the reason why he didn't rebut anything in his opening, because that's not what it's for. He mentioned the slave Bible and brought up the point that I brought up, uh, but then he really didn't say anything about it. He just said, oh, he brought that up, but then nothing. 
just crickets. Um, so first of all, he says that, uh, oh, in Leviticus chapter 25, um, the, it says that you may not rule over uh, ruthlessly over your uh, fellow uh, brothers. And he says this implies that uh, you can do that over the foreigners. But Jacob Milgram in his commentary on it, uh, which uh, Dr. Josh quotes in his book, says that uh, there, uh, there's a direct parallel between these two. But when it comes to this um, ex expliciting uh, or making this explicit, there is an uneasiness in this and it is inferred from the pericope structure. But however, this leaves the topic um, uh, as an injunction unresolved. So he points to the fact that uh, it repeats the injunction of D not to treat the Israelite harshly, implying that the non-slave may be treated harshly. This conclusion can only be drawn by comparison and two panels. Apparently, there was some uneasiness, so they didn't ex explicitly state it. So that's showing that, look, just be – he's saying that you can't draw that conclusion because the Bible doesn't draw the conclusion, and it uses an exact parallel until it gets to that point, and then it does not use the rest of that parallel because it's not saying that you can treat those people that way. Matter of fact, if you look at Leviticus chapter 25, you're going to see that you're supposed to actually treat the um, the Hebrews or the uh, Israelites – he says Hebrews, but the Israelites – as foreigners. It actually says that in verse 23. Uh, I mean, uh, sorry, um, sorry, uh, I believe verse 20, 35, yeah, um, yeah, 35, if any of your fellow Israelites become poor and unable to support themselves among you, help them as you would a foreigner and a stranger so they can continue to live among you. Do not take any interest or profit from them and so forth, okay? So this is supposed to be about the foreigner except you're supposed to treat them like the foreigners. Oh, um, but on my view of the household, which is laid out in Households in the Ancient Near East by Lark Culbertson, um, the foreigner residing amongst you, if um, they are also treated under the same law. There's a great book by uh, Mark, um, Mark Glanville called Refuge Reimagined, where he points out the uh, uh, adoption, marriage, kinship, which is used, I think Leviticus chapter 25 is actually using that. So um, whenever it says in verse 45 that um, you may also buy from the temporary residents among you, right? These are the ones, uh, the Tosab, uh, to, sorry, uh, living among you as members of your clans, born your country, they will become your property. The word property there is Akuza. Um, it's never used as of a human being. Uh, this would be the only uh, this would be the only usage of it out of the entire chapter and the entire Bible. Uh, but rather, I think it's better in, in light of Deuteronomy chapter 32 uh, to be translated as a part of your inheritance. Um, so they are to be uh, passed as part of the inheritance that same way Ruth was when Ruth came. And um, she was uh, part of the household. So when he said to the other guardian redeemer, will you redeem the, the property? And he says, yes. And he says, but Ruth's attached to this, this house. Then he goes, then I'm not going to do it because it'll put my inheritance at jeopardy. So I think that unless you want to translate this one verse, uh, or this, this word uh, in this one place different from all the others, that's going to have to be a hermeneutic that you're going to use throughout. And then you're going to have to explain why, then, this whole chapter is about redemption. It's about um, redemption for the um, for the citizen. And not only that, but scholars have pointed out, as well as Dr. Josh, uh, no R in this, um, that this isn't actually about can you own slaves, this chapter. I know a lot of people think that. But when you look at the scholarship on it, no, this is actually – targeted toward outlawing or abolishing, as some scholars put it, slavery for citizens. It's actually never – it's the norm in the ancient world to uh, to have slaves. Um, but also um, you have issues with ownership. First of all, if it's if this is saying you can own the, them as Akuzah, as property, well, it specifically says in Leviticus chapter 25 that God owns the Akuzah and that nobody else can own it. He says the land cannot be sold permanently because the land is mine and you reside, the citizen, 
in my land as foreigners and strangers. So that's twice in this same chapter that God called the Israelites foreigners and strangers. And he told them that they can't sell any of the land because it does not belong to them. They're not owners. They are mere holders, possessors of it. So in the same way, these people are being attached to the household. He says that um, um, Exodus is only talking about the Hebrew slaves being free. Then why does it say that a mixed multitude came out of there together? He says that the Hebrew wife doesn't go out as the uh, uh, as the the, the um, as the husband, but as Dr. Josh points out in his book in uh, Deuteronomy 15, it actually explicitly makes a development and changes. Converse, just in case you're able to hear me, we have a, we we missed the last five words or so of what you said. Converse, you're, it looks like you're the connection. So that then it says, sorry. We missed the last maybe 10 seconds of what you said. I think your connection kind of ebbed. Oh, sorry. I said that. uh, um, So he says that the Hebrew's wife doesn't go out when the the Hebrew goes out. But as Joshua Josh points out in Deuteronomy chapter 15, I believe it is, that is actually updated. And uh, as he calls it, a development where now the wife does go out. He said that Jesus says that slaves obey your masters. Jesus never says that. Paul says that. Uh, But Paul um, is... Living under the Roman Empire, Paul is not in charge. As it's been pointed out by Del Martin and plenty of others, New Testament scholars, that he is in no place to make a law. One he's minute. living, he's living under the rule of the Romans. They're not in charge. So he says, as I pointed out, First Corinthians chapter seven. If you're a slave when you're called to Christ, don't let it, you know, worry you too much. Like you're still, can, you can still be saved. But if you can free yourself, avail yourself of the opportunity, and don't make yourself a slave to human beings. I'll, I can end there, but you got it. We'll kick it back over to Aaron for his five minute, or we should say five minute, five eight minute. Re- no, no, no. Five minute, five minute cross, cross exam of Converse contender. Thank you very much, Aaron. The floor is all yours to ask questions of Converse. Oh, you're st- let me unmute you. I think it's still on there. There it goes. Yeah. All right. So on the one point that he brought up um, about treating for I was talking about treating foreign slaves with less care than you would give Hebrew slaves because that's what Exodus requires. You know, that, and that that was about the only thing that he brought up there that was relevant, except possibly the very last thing, which I'm going to ask him to repeat. The last thing was yeah. that um, it's been pointed out by uh, multiple scholars that um, the New Testament authors aren't in a position to make laws for people. They're living under an authoritarian uh, re- uh, Roman government. So when Paul says something like, if you can free yourself, avail yourself of the opportunity, but if you can't, don't let it be too much, of, you know, don't let it bother you too much. He's saying like, look, we don't have the power to change this right now. Okay, mm-hmm. but Christ will come back and he'll change it. The first will be la- last and the last will be first, you know? Okay, never mind. It wasn't relevant after all. Okay, so at what point, uh, how, how, do you, how do you contest the Bible giving God's permission to, to keep slaves? When, when God says you may have slaves, you may buy them and their children and so forth, and a man can sell his daughter into slavery, and, but she can't be let go under the same rules because God has different rules for how slavery is supposed to work. How do you, had Nothing you said here even relates to the point or the topic. Yeah, so whenever you – I was going to say in the rebuttal, but I ran out of time. So it's the same point. Whenever you say that uh, you shall buy them, you're using the word shall there. Um, you're making it seem like he's saying that, that like, this is something you ought to do or something. Well, what did I, I use uh, – Pick a different translation then. That's you fine. may that's buy fine. them. It doesn't matter. Listen, look, whenever in Westbrook's uh, a translation, he says, as for male and female slaves that you have, you may acquire slaves from the nations around you. You may mm-hmm. also acquire them from the alien residents with you and from yep. their families who are with you and, been yep. born, and who have been born in your land, and you shall yep. have them. Uh, so it doesn't part. say – that you you shall not purchase slaves because that's evil and bad and naughty, right? It doesn't say anything like that, right? Yeah. So my okay, point so is God that gives I don't his think permission this is slavery. to yeah. buy slaves, to keep slaves, and have them forever, and yeah. specifies in a number of different places the th- how to treat your slaves, how to how badly you can beat your slaves, how much the slaves should cost, 
how much male slaves at a certain age should cost more than female slaves of another age. So God supposedly, you know, we know that the, the book isn't written by God, obviously, as people pretending to speak for God. But nonetheless, the Bible says all of these provisions for how slavery is to be maintained and performed. And where does it say, where does it contradict all of that to say that no Slavery is is evil and a sin and an abomination worse than eating shellfish. Okay, well, yeah, so there's a few things there. One is, I don't, like I've said in my opening, I think what's happening here is the same thing that's happening with Ruth. She's actually entering a household, being attached to the household as a foreigner, so that as uh, uh, it's been pointed out by Dale Martin and by Laura Culbertson, that this is the only way for slaves upward mobility in societies back then. So it's not, I don't take this as actually being a slave. It's like a type of household adoption or marriage. Um, but also whenever you talk about um, the last point you made about shellfish, people always bring up shellfish and mixed fabrics and stuff. Like, as I said before, uh, like, like these are things for their time. Mixed fabrics wasn't just a thing about our clothes today. It was like they were trying to be a cop. They were putting on a cop's uniform. This is what the priests wore was mixed fabrics and stuff. The shellfish place, was – yeah, so the, the point was they were lying about who they were. It was a disguise and so forth. So, like, I'll argue, like, Christ says, as, as again, that Christ, that um, Moses gave you things for the hardness of your hearts. It wasn't that way from the beginning. The beginning is Eden. If you look at there, it, where there are people owning slaves and where there are people, you know, uh, murdering each other and all this stuff. No, there wasn't. So, there, there wasn't that's people the idea. murdering each other? Not needed, no. no like there was the no. entirety of, of the Old Testament? Uh, like uh, Moses didn't um, kill the Egyptians? James and, and, Eden, there wasn't. I'm sorry, what? Converse, uh, I don't James, know are we having a problem? I think if you are able to turn your camera off, Converse. Yeah, we... sorry. I think I'm better now. We, I think we're losing your audio. I think we're there. good now. We, it's happened several times. If yeah. You insist on keeping your camera on, but if it happens one more time, I'm just going to turn it off myself. Because it, we do. It is sometimes happening where we we lose ten seconds of what mm -hmm. you're saying. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was saying in Eden, there's not any. It's not in Eden. There wasn't any murder. But I, I would restart my uh, audio. Okay. Well, if, well, in a in a city or in a in a community of a population of two. It's not terribly surprising that there wasn't any murder in that story. But that doesn't, okay. that doesn't address any of the rest of it, does it? I mean, none of it. Okay, that's just what you asked me. So I was just, just your question. Well, actually, I didn't it. ask you anything having to do with the story of Eden. Okay, you said there wasn't murder then? And I said, no, not in Eden. Yeah, you you said that you, what that we were talking about in general Bible times. You said there there weren't people keeping slaves, which of course there were, and you said they weren't people running around, you know, murdering each other, which of course they were, and Moses was responsible for an awful lot of that in the very sacred pavels that we are talking about. Okay, that's fine if you want to say that, but uh, I disagree. Um, you disagree that Moses murdered people? Well, no, I was disagreeing that what you were saying that I was saying. I wasn't saying any of that. Okay. I, I wasn't left. saying anything that you were saying. I was only commenting on what you were not saying. You didn't address the verses in the Bible that advocate for slavery. As a matter of fact, you admitted that they do. And then I guess not the case. tried what you thought would be an excuse to, uh, to, to, to nullify that. Maybe I, I have no idea what you thought your argument was. That's right. You don't. We'll go into the five minutes of cross-exam by Converse of Aaron. Okay, Aaron, do you uh, do you think that any allowance of uh, holding people as servants uh, to do labor for you is, uh, uh, if you you know deal with it at all, that you promote uh, slavery? Can you phrase that as an intelligible question? If you do, you think that that any allowance of slavery is promoting slavery? That any allowance of slavery is promoting yeah. slavery. So but, if I if there are four or five categories of slavery that I recognize and I promote one of them, am I promoting slavery? Yeah. Promotion of any one of the categories would be promoting slavery. Okay. You don't have to well, promote all of them. If you're promoting one of them, then well, no, I said allowing. Yes. I said allowing for any of them. Allowing for any of them. 
Yeah, like if, if I were to allow my neighbor, for example, to own a slave or something to that effect to work for him. In what, uh, in what and, case is this up to you? What, what are I'm you able asking, to do about it? Let's say, let's say that he were to have a slave and he were to uh, make products and I purchase products from him, uh, mm-hmm. from a slave. Does that make me promote slavery? Well, you, you might be unwittingly so, depending on the situation. But if you are aware that this person has a slave, mm-hmm. are you going to continue to do business? With that person? Yeah, so um, what I was going to say is that everybody's electronics today are, are taken out of cobalt mines and so forth that are used by slave labor. There's clear. Can you show me that of any of my devices, books. by any of my brand yes, names or what have you, yes, are made by slaves? Yeah, and but I'm going to be if asking they are, questions. If they, if they are, then I'm not going questions. to buy those devices. Yes, I can. It's. De- I can definitely show you that uh, without a shadow of a doubt. I somehow doubt um, that, seeing so, the point of the debate well, where you've gone with it so far. Yeah, but that's it's, fine. It's a you completely different thing. Yeah, look, if you want to speculate aimlessly, that's fine. But what I'm saying I, no, is, I'm do- that's what you're doing. That. That's it's exactly clear, what I'm saying to you. It's if clear. You look, this is well, my just time, to be sure so that you guys aren't talking fine. over each other. I'm going discussion. to interrupt because they can't hear you if you guys yeah. are both talking at the same time. So yeah. you're going to have to take turns. Yeah. yeah. So so I would well, not knowingly. Okay, now you're both talking again. So all right. So Converse, go ahead and ask your question clearly in a quick, concise question only. And then we'll give Aaron a chance to respond. Yeah, so I, th- I thought it was pretty quick and clear. I thought so uh, too. Right, I was so, answering it. Okay. So, um, yeah, so um, in Leviticus chapter 25 that you talked about so well, uh, well you actually you quoted from Jefferson Davis, which I found was odd, uh, and you seem to agree with him. Uh, it's odd that you were bringing up D- Jefferson Davis, but it seemed like you had no familiarity with the slave Bible. What do you think about the fact that it Why took did- out every foundational story from the beginning? Well, I don't know. I don't have a lot of. Don't, I haven't looked at the, the slave Bible to see what was missing. I know it exists. I know that it took out key portions for certain reasons because they wanted to keep slaves oppressed. So they would they would uh, they would take out anything that had to do with you know like forcing the masters to let go of the Hebrews or whatever, you know things like that. But like I said, I've never had a, a slave Bible in my hand, but I know that it exists. I I'm, was aware of Jefferson Davis because I'm an uh, ex- activist in Texas and because my state board of education wanted to remove Thomas Jefferson as a reference from our social studies textbooks to replace him with Jefferson Davis. And in the citation that they pointed to was his justification in the Bible for slavery. Because, yeah, there are people in the Republican Party that I'm constantly fighting against who have actually advocated for the reinstatement of slavery. Yeah, so that's the danger of reading the Bible as some um, atheists read it today. As but some atheists read that's it why today. I, Was Jefferson Davis an atheist? Sorry. I are, the, are the GOP who support this? I, mean, I can question. name a couple of people in the Republican Party who have advocated for the reinstatement yeah, of slavery. I guarantee you they're Christian, I, not I atheist. So it is not yeah. how the atheists read it. It's oh, how it's Jefferson Davis and these other gotcha. Christians, these white supremacists and yeah. so forth, it's how they read it. Okay, 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 we got it. Okay. I didn't say all atheists, did I? Okay, so you didn't right, have so, to. There's no atheists so, that read the Bible like. All right, that. sorry, sorry. Could I continue? All right. So you think that uh, doing an internal critique of this worldview is to assume a bunch of things that I don't believe about the Bible, and then to try to critique it? Why would I do that? Why would I think that? It was especially being the opposite of what I've already done. Okay, so you're not doing an internal critique on the biblical worldview. No. We're talking about okay. the, the purpose of the debate today is, is the Bible pro-slavery? Has fuck all to do with your worldview. We're talking about what the text says, but not what some scholar says on his opinion, regardless of, of, of because of their worldview. It's what does the text say as people read it, as Christians read it, and then like Jefferson Davis, come up with that opinion of it, because that's how they read it. That's what they thought it said. You're supposed to address that. Is the text translated by scholars? To respond, I can give you a chance to respond, Aaron, and then we have to go into the closings. Okay. Is the text interpreted by scholars? Yeah, lots of different ways. Not that that's relevant either. We'll jump into the closing statements. These are five minutes each as well. First, <clears throat> Aaron, the floor is all yours. I'm sorry, what are we doing now? Closing statements, and then we'll have Q&A. Oh, okay, well... Yeah, the point of the Bible or the point of the uh, the discussion here 
Can you read the Bible and come away with the impression that it advocates slavery? Since God gives express permission and guidelines on how you may own slaves and how you can buy them from the neighbors and how you can even keep children as slaves and they are to be your property forever and all of these things that the, and never ever 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 once does it ever contradict that not even on moral grounds like it should like it would if it wasn't pro slavery if it wasn't pro slavery they, it would be either neutral about it or it would condemn it there would at least be a contradiction in there somewhere but there's not always only ever. Yes, you can have slaves. Yes, you can keep slaves. Yes, be like slaves, be like slaves unto Christ, whatever. That's the message throughout, consistent, never changes. What I said, folks, sorry, I was muted. I is, was able to hear you. We're going to go into a five-minute closing from Converse, followed by 35 minutes of Q&A. Converse, the floor is all yours. Thanks. Look, I am i don't know everything, okay, uh, but I've been reading a lot about the topic. Uh, I happen to think that Dr. Josh's book uh, is you know, quite a good introduction to the topic. Uh, all this, uh, At least most of the scholars I, I cited tonight are references from his book. Um, but I know that we obviously disagree on some stuff as well. We agree on some things. We disagree on others. When I started looking at the scholarship, I was surprised about how much disagreement there is. If you look at Bernard Levinson's book um, uh, or paper, you'll see that there is just immense uh, disagreement between Milgram, Levinson, um, Van Cedars, and uh, ja Yasher, and, and many others. So, uh, But the point is, like, look – a lot of the things that he said that like quoting Christ or quoting, you know, different people like weren't even quotes from them. So, I mean, like it's, it's, there's definitely a bunch of issues in this debate. I think that sometimes this is looked at as more of like a um, sporting event than it is an actual like uh, trading back and forth of ideas to see who's actually right. And that's uh, one of the problems I think with this debate bro culture. Um, I do want to say that uh, as Paul put it, um, Love is the fulfillment of the law. Love does no wrong to to the neighbor. Um, Christ uh, let us know that, like, look, you had uh, Moses giving certain laws because of the hardness of the heart, like divorce, which is actually tied to um, to uh, slavery in the sense that um, the wife was uh, part of the household. And uh, but you do have these huge distinctions. For example, uh, Arn used Israelite and Hebrew interchangeably, but there are papers that argue that they're not the same. Um, so you can read some of those papers. Uh, a lot of scholars don't think this is the case, but um, some do because there's a tight connection between the Ivory and the um, a, a period. And so, um, you know, there's a lot to be said there. Uh, and then lastly, I guess I'll just end by saying like, Look, Paul, uh, Paul in Philippians chapter 2, I'm just going off memory here, says something like, Christ, although he existed in the very form of God, did not see the equality he had with God, something to be held onto, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant to serve us, even to the point of a death on the cross, and count yourself as nothing, put others before yourself to reenact him. And then uh, as um, uh, was pointed out by um, sorry, Tom Holland, not the actor, but the uh, classicist. Um, Christ died a slave's death. He said the last will be first, the first will be last. He said, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've also done to me. So, I mean, it's just a hard thing to tell Christians that when they read their Bible and they see all this stuff, that they're just insane and that these uh, five verses that you have, um, you know, get rid of all the other lessons taught in the Bible. But uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you very much for that closing as well, Converse. We are going to jump into the Q&A, and we want to say welcome to Aaron's friend. What is your dog's name? He is Bowie. Super cute. Yep. That face. <laughs> He's a uh, Dachshund Corgi mix, and they call this breed a Dorgi. Super cute. 
want to say, folks, before we jump into the Q&A, a couple of quick housekeeping things. In particular, as you can see at the bottom right of your screen, Modern Day Debate has a podcast. Folks, if you have not yet checked out the Modern Day Debate podcast, pull out your phone or pull up your favorite podcast app on your phone. Find Modern Day Debate. As it is ad-free, you can listen to debates on the go. We want debates to be available as much as possible. And so do check that out. We also take out the music. If you don't like the music at the start here on YouTube, well, hey, no music on the podcast. Check it out. With that, we're going to jump into the Q&A. Thank you very much for your questions. Do appreciate it. This first one coming in from Von Zoom. Appreciate it. It says, May I debate on here sometime? Absolutely, Vaughn. And I saw an email came in from you. I'll get back to you. Also said, Arn and Raw, thank you for helping in my deconstruction. I don't know if that's slang or if you meant deconversion, but in either case, sounds like he's thanking you, Arn. Yeah, this one coming yeah. in from Magellan says, my ears are bleeding. Thank you for that. Very informative. <laughs> Camp counselor Steve says, nice sermon, Converse, but please address the topic. Thank you. Converse, any thoughts? Did you not address the topic? Yeah, I mean, he's just being lame. I don't really care about that. <laughs> you got it. All right. This one from Magellan as well says, Converse, I cannot actually discern individual words. Let's see. Melody Kate says, are you saying people are adopted and not slaves in the Bible, Converse? So Ruth was not raped and owned. She was an adopted family member? Yeah, that's right. If you look at Ruth, she specifically goes to do, uh, goes to uncover the feet of Boaz, meaning to sleep with him. And he says, no, wait, 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 look, I'd gladly do this, but um, there's somebody closer than me in the family. I'll go to town tomorrow and like, I'll, I'll see if he will marry you and take over the house. If he won't, then I'll do it. Okay. And then she's like, oh, yeah, okay, and he does it, okay? So he comes back whenever the other guy's like, I'm not doing that. No, I'll put my inheritance at Jeopardy. So, yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. And as far as adoption goes, yes, you can read Mark Glanville's work, and uh, you can read uh, as well in um, – uh, there's a few things in Milgram that talks about this as well. Muffs takes the position, for example. You got it. This one coming in from, do appreciate it, S – or I should say nine deal nine. I didn't see a question attached, but put it in the chat as a normal question. And I can ask that if you'd like. Bitter Truth says, Aaron, I'm your fan. Since I watched your debate, you defeated Nadir Ahmed. What brings you out of religion myths? I think they're saying what's brought you out of religion most of all. Maybe most of the, what's the primary factor, let's say. No, for, for me, you don't have to. It's not that I believe something and you have to prove it wrong. It's that if I think that this is, you know, this is true or closest to the truth or what have you, and I want to improve my understanding of it, and then in that investigation I discover that what I was told was true was in fact not true, and, and that there is actually no truth to it, I've already stopped believing it. If you can't show that there's any truth to it, we're done. If it requires faith, we're done. You got it. This one coming in from Duchess of Clutches. TTV says, does the Bible contain the same prescriptions about adultery as it does for slavery? Can you commit adultery if you treat your mistress nicely, Converse? Oh, you might. Let me check. Well, Christ, okay. uh, I'm, I'm good. Uh, so Christ said uh, when he was talking about divorce, he said that you're, you, you can't divorce. Uh, Moses gave that law because the hardness of your heart. He said, but except on the case of adultery. So he did make that um, explicit, that rule, to be separated. This one coming in from, do appreciate it, Lethanitol HV, or HVAC says, Aaron, was slavery always wrong? If so, why didn't any secular intellectuals ever criticize its existence? But it was Christians who have led the abolitionist movements, recently William Wilberforce. Okay, so why have all why have all secularists criticized slavery? I think they're and saying if so, why why didn't any secular? I know they're pretending secular... they're pretending that no intellectual that no secular intellectual ever condemned slavery, when that's just false. Of course they did. A this number one... of Christians did too, but that doesn't mean that this is an atheist versus Christian thing. You also have to remember that you know for a long time there was under the rule of uh, you know kill the infidel the unbeliever on the word of one or two witnesses, and you don't have to go you know somebody who understands natural selection will certainly understand that 
you don't have to go through too many generations of that before all you have left are blind believers right so it's it's hard to have a community where you can express free thought when they're going to kill you over it so there's there's that to consider as well you got it and thanks very much for your super chat question or i should say announcement james w says after show at ab newman's channel that's linked in the description folks if anybody wants to do an after show for our debates, we are always willing to give them a plug and put them in the description box, folks. So if you ever do want to do it, we're willing to do it for you too, whether you be Christian, atheist, Muslim, you name it. They say, if so, why didn't any... Uh, they said, Aaron, we would be honored if you would stop by and there's going to be an open mic. Folks, you should come and celebrate why you think Aaron was more persuasive or tell us why you didn't think he was more persuasive. Thank you to all of you. Thanks for that, James W. That's linked in the description box. Yeah, I got a comment on that, James. So I'm wondering why it wouldn't be honor if I stop by. <laughs> I'm, I'm only kidding. Juicy, to say the least. Alphanetic says, question for Aaron. Richard Dawkins said he is done debating Christians because they are so impossible to reason with. How close are you to this point? <laughs> uh, very nearly. Uh, I only do this uh, for the for the spectators. I frequently get, and I want to say that I, I average about one a day, uh, messages from former believers thanking me for something I did that helped them, you know, walk their their way out of uh, out of the, the delusions of religious faith and into rationality. So I mean that that keeps me going. That keeps me doing this work. It's a little bit at a time, but it's something. Juicy. This one from Bite Me XD. You know this one's gonna be good. Okay, they say R. They say Aaron won the debate as usual. Who was Converse? Thank you very much. As they say good James, one. thanks for changing the intro song. I believe in your channel. Thank you for your kind words. And now you know who Converse is. He's linked in the description if you want to hear more from him as well as Aaron. Aaron, did you have anything to add? I just want the one thing that that uh, Converse said that I agree with that when you do these live debates, it is performance art. It's not about communication of, of ideas. I would much rather that, and that the only way to do those type debates is to have it in writing. You know, where you don't have a live audience, you put a live audience in it, then it's a performance. A hundred percent. Yeah, and you know what, Ozzy Man. Uh, you might know him from way back, G Plus days. Uh, I actually talked to him about that not too long ago. He's uh, like one of the most popular atheists at, uh, uh, online. And he says, look, back before we had these hangouts like this, we had just writing. We just had keyboard chats. And so you couldn't get by with rhetoric that you can get by on here. You have to type it all out. So I can yep. check it line by line and respond. And exactly. the same thing was said by Dr. Michael Heiser, where he said, debating is a waste of time. Just give me a paper to read. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm right there. Juicy. I'm intrigued by it because I know Heiser is quite the intellectual. I do have to ask if Heiser, given that you know I'm at least partisan in favor of debates, if Heiser has read the empirical literature on randomized controlled trials on whether or not debates, video debates, are persuasive, I can tell you I have. So. Oh, good, yeah. Look, James, I'm not saying that debates are useless, right? That's was Heiser's view. My view is that debates could be more productive if they weren't such, um, like, uh, fandom, you know, like, fandom-esque. Yeah. Sometimes there's too much rhetoric and tribalism. I can agree with that. Eddie Dean, there's, thanks there's so much. A, there's an aspect of how you do these live debates. You know, the, both of us show up. We don't know what the other one has said. We're going to have to address everything that the other one said without having heard it. That's a problem already. Then I've noticed when we do, especially like dealing with creationists and such, they'll pull out uh, some scientific paper that I've never heard of that supposedly says something. And in written debates, I'll have the opportunity to read that paper that they cited before I make my reply, which you can't do when you're doing it live on stage. But in a written debate, I can, and invariably, I have always seen that the paper they cited that does not actually say what they said it did. But there's no way you'd know that in a live debate, which is just one of the many failures of doing live debates. Juicy, to say the least. Eddie Dean says, Converse, it is clear to all listening that you didn't say anything close to the Bible as being anti-slavery. 
Will you clear that up, please? Yeah, uh, I'll clear it up. I mean, how many times are you going to say clear? You know, it's maybe it's near, maybe it's cl- I'm like, dude, he said that it's clear to everybody. I'm glad you speak for everybody listening. But uh, besides that point, like, I mean, look, I get it. A lot of people like like Aaron and same thing with Matt, Dylan Hunty and others. Like I've heard people call in and say to you know them that you're my idol and stuff, right? It doesn't mean that you can't just listen to what I said. Like I, I literally went through and cited verses. I cited scholars. I gave references. If you think I said nothing, you haven't even began to read on the topic. Look, I'm not saying I'm right, but I'm saying that like if you think I said nothing there, you just haven't started at, at all yet. This one coming in from, do want to say, folks, I'm also fixing the links in the description box. Glad we're catching this while we're live. As someone let me know that the links were broken, so I'm fixing those right now. Appreciate the feedback. Mark Reed in the chat. And this one coming in from Cool Lambo says, if you cannot argue without ad hominems, then your argument has no merit. Fair Amen. enough. This one from James W. says, Converse, we would be honored to have you there as well. Let's go. I like uh, Amy, so I don't, uh, yeah, we've never had any issues. I've always liked Amy, so. Let me just double check in case there are any last questions that I had not gotten to ask. Otherwise, we might wrap up slightly early. I was afraid that we were going to go over time. Let's see. This one says, got that one. Well, let me just say that, uh, you know, I can appreciate Aaron taking his time as well. Um, I, 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 I've seen some things from Aaron. I know he, he really more specializes in, in things like um, evolution and, and certain things uh, in those aspects. So, I'm, you know, I can appreciate that. And, and as while, while I don't uh, know the arguments quite as well as him, I tentatively, you know, accept evolution as being the case and so forth. So I could, I've got some, um, you know, I've got some information off some of his videos that, you know, is informative. So there's that at least. Appreciate it. You got it. This one, let me just see. I think we might have the last of them. I'm going to reload the page here. I want to remind you, folks, a couple of things. First, as mentioned, well, actually, we hadn't mentioned this. Folks, if you love debates and you have friends who love debates, consider hitting that share button and sharing this debate with people out there, your friends in particular, so you can share that enjoyment with them. And we are determined. We are on a mission at Modern Day Debate to give everybody a fair shot, whether they be Muslim, atheist, Christian, anti-theist, all of the strange creatures in between. We really do want to give everybody a fair shot. So we appreciate when you do share our links as that does help a lot. Eddie Dean with a quick last question says, Converse, will you please say, quote, the Bible is against slavery? Would you, I think they're yeah, saying, would you go that far? Yeah, I would say the Bible is against slavery. Yes, that's um, it's not pro-slavery and it is against slavery. Yes. So I think that... The thing is, I don't think Christians sometimes are nuanced enough, and I don't think they give, for example, uh, Dr. Josh enough credit. Um, and and people hate me for this. You gotta understand, I'm in an unenviable position. The atheists hate that I'm arguing for the position that I am, right? But the Christians aren't backing me up in the comments and stuff, saying, "Oh no, no, he is right." No, they're saying, "Stop giving him credit." Like so, but I'll say that, uh, even on his view, the Bible has a development where it moves away from these things. He just says that he doesn't think it goes far enough. He even said one time that, look, Leviticus chapter 25, given what it's saying there about free, uh, abolishing this for uh, citizens, I'll go as far as to say that it, it, it does look at it as a bad thing, uh, but it doesn't go far enough is what he says. So, like, look, you got to give credit where credit is. You got it. This one from T.O. I'll be interested in asking Dr. Joss about that. T-O, uh, TLO says, is there a single verse that outright condemns slavery, or is there no such verse? Well, um, yeah, I mean, I would take, uh, I mean, if, if you just mean, because this is, I get confused by this question. Sometimes. sometimes people say, is there any verses that are like abolitionist type verses? And then I'll quote one, they'll say, no, that doesn't say slavery's done, right? And I'll say, oh, you don't mean verses that can be used for abolition. You mean Verses that say slavery's done or something, right? And in the New Testament, they just didn't have that power. So Paul says, look, if you can get free, get free. Don't be a slave to humans, right? But if not, it shouldn't bother you too much. Um, but then in the in the Old Testament, um, as I pointed out in 
Leviticus chapter 25, that whole passage is about abolishing slavery for non for, for citizens. And so um, I would say in that sense, um, it does for citizens. And then I think it goes, um, you know, with the other verses that I cited, it goes to outlaw it. But there's no explicit verse that says it's done now. It's just out of context, you know. Paul thought that Paul probably thought that the end was near. So why try to go out of your way to fight the government when the end's near? You know. Like, so there so. is no verse in the Bible that condemns slavery. There are I didn't several say that condemned. promote it. I didn't say that condemned. condemned. It. No, I didn't say condemned. I don't think there's any Bible verses that promote it. But I didn't well, say. I read some. Yeah, I thought then, all the ones you said that they were actually about condemning slavery, even though. God is saying, you may own slaves, you may buy them, you may keep them forever. You're saying that's really condemning slavery. Yeah, I'm saying that no scholar who writes on that is saying that that is about the fact that you can own slaves. Owning slaves was the most normal thing, of, one of the most normal things in the ancient world. It's like capitalism. So then, of course, but if it's... the Bible is the product of its time, and the time was pro-slavery, then the Bible is pro-slavery. No, oh, because you didn't let me finish. What that passage is actually about when you read the scholarship is about abolishing it for citizens. You can only have the household the, – the people in your household come from the foreigners around you. So it actually is abolishing amongst foreigners, and I think that that's adoption, as I said, into the household for upward mobility in society. But so you can even disagree. if that were true, and I don't think it is, but even if it were true, you're only talking about depriving – certain people of their ability to own slaves while not condemning the institution at all. No, I don't think that's the case because, as I said, why would you make this entire chapter uh, outlawing slavery among citizens if, in fact, it was fine? You well, should just was, yeah, not if, do that. If it was fine, then you would keep it for everybody else, just not certain people wouldn't have. But if the if the institution – if the Bible is not pro-slavery, then the Bible would condemn slavery. It would not endorse and promote slavery like it does. Yeah, I don't think it does at all. I think yeah, – like and, and not just pr uh, promote uh, and endorse but permit as well. Yeah, if it permits uh, – allows for uh, – promotes slavery, then so do you when you bought that microphone because you allowed for it to come in your home. You paid your money for it. It was made by a slave, and yes, it can be proven. So um, it's easy. I like most people know this is pretty common sense. The materials are mined out of third world countries. So even if that were the case, what does that have to do with the Bible? The case, it, the, the, even if that were the case, because when people say, like, uh, oh, if it even allowed at some point for this to take place, well, you allowed for these things to come to your home. Yeah. Are you uh, just no, as bad I mean, as it? I don't know if this hairbrush was made by slaves. Okay. If you can show me that it was, why, hey, I'll, I won't buy a hairbrush from this company anymore. Okay. The problem I'm is not going to, I'm not going to allow even you know, implicitly I'm not going to allow you know, or, or promote or permit slavery where I'm aware of it. OK. But the problem but we is this. We're talking about does the Bible – is the Bible pro-slavery? That's fine. You already said the, the Bible endorses – the Bible permits, promotes, and allows slavery for certain people, and you're saying that it's that it's actually prohibiting against – I don't agree with that either, but you're saying that it's actually prohibiting slavery for certain people, but leaving the, insta the institution intact. That the, pop, the populace was pro-slavery. The Bible that is a product of this populace is very is obviously pro-slavery. It endorses slavery, gives God's permission for it, and you, no. you said nothing to address this. Yeah, I don't think so. You've even made the admission that there is not a single verse that condemns slavery, but you're going to say that the whole Bible does. No, I didn't say that. I said there's not a single verse that uh, abolishes slavery because it wasn't uh, – I mean there is one for the citizens alone, but in total it's just a progression throughout. But then the last thing I'll say on this maybe is um, – look, there is just um, – when you read a, this one verse out of context, right, and then you read the scholarship, you realize what they're saying is, wow, this is a groundbreaking um, passage in the ancient world. It's the only one of its kind. That's outlawing uh, slavery for citizens in any of the literature. No other literature goes as far as doing this. It's insane in the literature. So people don't I'm look at this, look this as the same. Because I don't it's know fine. this verse, so I'm going to ask you for more one more reference so that I can look it up. But again, that still does not condemn the institution, even if it deprives certain people of, the, of being able to have their slaves, which I don't okay. think that does. But I have to read it before I yeah. went well, let me ask one more and question. And I don't read here. anything out of context. Well, let me ask one more. That's fine. Well, let me ask one more question here. Um, if 
I like because I can get you the book about the cobalt mines and and how slaves are making all the electronic. Okay, uh, and what okay? that have to and do with what I'm life? saying because what I'm asking you about consistency is okay. if you have those books, you said you wouldn't allow or permit any of this stuff to come to your home. So if that's the case, are you going to stop buying electronics if you were taught that? If all electronic, you're saying all electronics now. Not just anything with lithium, anything with cobalt, anything, anything with all that, that stuff. Every product yep. that includes lithium, every battery that you can buy, double A, they're all made by slaves. Lithium, yes, because all this stuff has to be priced accordingly. So they can't mine this out of expensive mines. So what? It, so there's an entire book written on it. I don't have the reference at hand, but I can get it for you. And if you see that, are you going to stop buying electronics? It would be difficult to not buy any electronics. Okay. But now I'm going to be forced into a situation. And again, this is on the assumption that you can prove that absolutely every single type of electronics are all made by okay. slaves. That's which fine. I think is an incredibly dubious claim. Okay, yeah, that's I, fine. I will, I will grant some, some products are. And I don't buy those products because I don't knowingly support slavery. But what I do has nothing to do with what the Bible Fair. does. The Bible does knowingly support slavery. We'll jump to this next question. Eddie Dean. We got that one. Cool Lambo says, could God have created a world without slavery? Converse. Well, that's a good question. That's, the question is more of a philosophical question about possible world semantics. And um, while I'm not exactly, I'm not sure if I want to get into that, you could say, um, I'll just refer to an author named um, Dr. McGregor, which um uh, Kurt McGregor, surprise, surprise to people who know me, uh, that I'm going to cite McGregor's book. Um, he, he, and he goes through this possible world semantics about what God could do, would do, you know, and all these types of things. Um, I take a uh, view of Molinism, which says that, um, you know, God creates this world because it's the best feasible world. So, um, but again, if you're interested, uh, actually, here's the book, Molinist uh, Philosophical and Theological Ventures. There's also a few other good books uh, by Ken Keith. So Lee, wouldn't it have been a better world if the Bible did say that slavery was a sin and an abomination and that it was and that it was wrong to own other people and force them into labor? That's where we, we're just disagreeing on that. So, yeah. so you you would think you think that the Bible if the world is better that the Bible doesn't prohibit slavery. No, I think that the Bible, so the you Bible can't, would be better um, if it did prohibit slavery or no, not. No, I'm saying we're disagreeing on the data. I'm saying you can't pick up the Bible and read all these foundational stories about the horrors of slavery and so forth and then read through all these passages of, of these foreigners who are taken into households and accepted as part of Israel, one law for the foreigner and for the citizen, right, and so forth, You tre all the way through till you get to Christ saying, whatever you do to the least of these, you've also done to me. Paul chastises the, 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 the um, people who come and eat and drink before the slaves get off work in the New Testament. It's pointed out in Slavery as Salvation by Dr. Uh, Dale Yeah, I wish Martin. that that was something having to do with my question. Let me try it again, because it's real easy. It yeah, I said we disagree the answer on the answer requires just a yes or a no. It's so damn simple. Would the Bible have been better? Would the world have been better if the Bible said, instead of you may own slaves, what if the Bible said you may not own slaves? Because that is an abomination and a sin and evil, and you shouldn't own other people and, and force them into servitude and bondage. Would the world have been better if the Bible prohibited slavery? That's a yes or a no. Well, I mean, I don't. I mean, I don't know the answer, but what I would say is that you don't I'm not, know the answer. I'm not to even that question. I'm not even accepting your premise. Is the problem when I say we disagree on the data? My premise. Yes, the premise. What premise. Where, yeah, because I don't even think that's. That the, the, what, I don't think what this premise is, is involved in that question. Because would the I world don't have think, been better if the Bible prohibited slavery? I think it does. Is the point we're disagreeing on the data. If instead of saying, I mean, I was very clear about this, if instead of saying you may own slaves and you may buy them and you may keep them forever and you may inherit them to your sons, instead of promoting slavery like those verses yeah, definitely do, what if it said you may not own slavery? Would the world be better if you just put the word not in there? Yeah, what I'm saying is you're wrong about that passage, okay? You don't understand yes no answer, what is being said. That. Yeah, well, would it be better if you stop being your wife, yes or no? The point is you disagree about the content of the question. Did the yes you or admit no that it says you may own slaves? You admit that it says that? 
I don't. No, I don't even think that's. No, I don't even think that's slaves there. If you look at Laura Culbertson's work on the slave in the household, what do you think it says? I don't even think that it's slaves. Exodus twenty-one. What do you think? I it already, says? I already pointed out. Wait, that's not Exodus twenty-one. That's Leviticus twenty-five. I'm talking about Exodus twenty-one, where it says First you may own slaves. And I think that it's household adoption. What do you think it says? No, no, that's your point. You're talking about. Oh, Leviticus. You're talking about Leviticus 25. No, I was not. But I, I think that it, what it's actually 21. doing is it's saying you cannot own slaves. Exodus 21, what does it say then? If you buy a Hebrew Exodus 21 is a chapter. So it what, which, that. Which, which verse are you talking about? Okay. Well, you're right. That is 25. I'm getting them confused. I think you're talking about Leviticus chapter 25. Yeah, I am. I am. Sorry about that. Okay, so when it says that you may own slaves, you may buy them from your neighbors. What if it put the word not in there? Okay. Would the world have been better? Yep, no worries. Yes, it would have been better if the Bible actually did prohibit slavery. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, so um, it would take an exegesis of this passage, but I don't think that that's actually what's happening. As I said, I don't think the word evit, uh, evit there is uh, actually slavery. Um, as Milgram points out, there is no uh, word. Only in Israel is there no separate word for chattel slavery in in Israel. Now, Does a lot of these scholars will still talk about it in that same way. But the, the issue is error? that... We've got to go to the next question. This one from Coffee Mom. Well, says, the bondage... I mean, different categories of slavery. Let's just, like, prohibit all slavery. Would that, would that not have been better? doesn't matter what category it is. Yeah, again, I don't think it's slavery. Okay, I think that the ancient world okay. have... Yeah, that's fine. I don't think it is. Okay, everybody translates it as slavery, but you don't think it is. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so as I pointed out, Milgram says that there's no separate word. Only in Israel is there no separate word for slavery and servant. This one from Coffee Mom says, Converse, have you ever studied the Old Testament with Jewish scholars? I don't mean, uh, I don't know if she means in person or she just means like reading the works of Jewish scholars. Uh, mm -hmm. or anyone outside of Christian apologists. I think she means the works of atheist scholars as well, or Jewish scholars. Yeah, so uh, the, the person I've been citing, Milgram, is a Jewish scholar. Um, he has uh, uh, Milgram, uh, Jacob Milgram, and then there's uh, plenty of others, like uh, ben, Dr. Benjamin Somers is another scholar that I'm, I'm constantly reading. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Uh, uh, there's a Yale series on YouTube. Um, I'm blanking on the name now, but yeah, plenty of them. Dr. Milgram's book on just four chapters of Leviticus is over 900 pages. Okay, so it's not like I haven't put in some time to read these things. Every one of these references that Josh put in his book, I picked up. Okay, Culbertson. I mean, you name it. I, I, I'm not somebody that's sitting up here just talking like random people do and say, uh uh, I don't believe it's there. I'm actually reading these resources that. that he's I mean, quoting. Every, every, all these okay? different translations of the Bible, they all say. No, slavery. you haven't they, seen, you don't know a single one of these books. You haven't read a verse out of them. Can you name a single I'm scholar that you've read on the NIV, topic? The NIV, the KGV, the number of different translations, are because I'm looking at this, that this one verse or these two verses in a multiple of different translations, and they translate it as slavery, but you're saying that all those translations are wrong. Because you've got some scholar who then says that when the Jews say that they were complaining that they were in bondage, that it doesn't mean bondage. Apparently that means they were on vacation. I don't know what that means. Yeah, so number one, uh, there's like there's like six or four or five words for for slavery in, in that's used as slavery or servant in these passages, right? There's only one that for sure, you know, is what we're going to think about that's a fed. But even that passage, there is no distinction. Like I said, between the um, the person who's a bond servant and the person and you who's not. You have to read it in context. And so where I, it says that you may keep yes, those children. And the children belong to them. They're your property, and you can have them all their lives and inherit them to your son. Yes. And you don't think that's describing slavery? So, in the no, no, no. Sense? Because even that word, for example, property, the scholars admit it's never once used of a human, except okay, for so translated when you're talking here. Talking about the Hebrew man who puts the all through his ear. Because the option is that if he goes free, he doesn't get to take the wife and children with him that he created. And why don't they get to go with him? 
Yeah, so as Josh pointed out in the book, it's outlawed in Deuteronomy chapter I mean, 15, where they say that now the wife does go out. So they actually, that actually was updated. But it doesn't matter because on the verse uh, that I quoted with Christ, uh, Moses just allowed for things because they're barbaric. So that's not even on my view, right? So, no. yeah. This one coming in from, do appreciate your question. Tilo says, did God make our world knowing people would have slaves? If so, doesn't this make him directly responsible for the existence of slavery? This is kind of already brought up, but in terms of whether or not God is directly responsible, Converse? No, I don't think so. Um, this is going to be primary and secondary causation. If you look at the, you know, like some of the literature that's been on this, I have looked at some of it. Um, and basically, like, um, so think about this. You know for certain that somebody in your class, your professor, somebody in your class is going to cheat on the exam. But uh, in light of, you know, allowing for others to prove their honesty, you say, don't, don't cheat on this exam. Then you go to the bathroom. Right. When you come back you did, and that somebody cheated, you did not make them cheat on the exam. They're the primary cause of their cheating, even if you knew that it would take place. So, yeah, I just don't think so. Um, but, yeah, again, that'll go into another topic that's uh, not about this. Mr. Monster says, would the world be better if one of the Ten Commandments was thou shalt not own slaves? It's a lot the same as, uh, like, would the world be better if there was no slavery? But if you want to address it, Converse, in the sense of whether or not it was embedded in the Ten Commandments. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I... I mean, there is uh, the do not covet law to say don't covet your neighbor's slave. But, um, you know, I, I don't even think that I don't even take the same view that the slavery is ever even really talked about. I think that this is uh, at most a type of servitude. It was outlawed for citizens in Leviticus chapter 25. So, yeah, I could be wrong. You know, a lot of people disagree with me. So but that's uh, the current view. This one from Mr. Monster says, Got that one. Talus and Oberlander says the Roman Empire was Christian for over a thousand years. How did this persist until it fell when Christianity was its state religion? Yeah, so I don't take it that uh, we should put any stock in the fact that the Roman Empire, Christianity became the religion of the state. Like that, for me, that doesn't it doesn't matter because that didn't mean that they went, they, they stopped being, you know, terrible barbaric people there's a book uh, by uh, vince bontu a multitude of all peoples that book goes through some of the atrocities that christians in that world uh committed on the pagans in that world and so i'm not one of these like ultra you know right-wing catholics that say like no they they started doing well you know as soon as it was passed you know to from peter to rome i'm not taking that view this one coming in from Cool Lambo says, did the early Christians read James Milgram? I think, is James Milgram, do I remember right? That's the Jewish scholar when someone asked you if you read Jewish scholars and you said James Milgram was, who, was that the Jewish scholar? Yeah, that's right. Somebody um, asked me about that scholarship. That's why I cited it. But uh, did the early Christians read Milgram, who is, you know, dead now, but who wrote in the 20th century? Um, I think the answer to that is obviously no. Uh, but the what's underlying this question is to say, hey, what about the early church? Well, we did have a lot of um, you know early church fathers that that looked down on this, and, and some that uh, you know were early in their time. Uh, for example, um, Luis de Molina um, was early for his time to say, look, he had the rationale that if God gave us free will, and slaves are just enslaved and brought in, and you can't. They're not able to choose. We should let them choose. Are they going to become, you know, Christians or not and so forth? So that was his rationale is they're not free to make the choice. So, you I mean, it. you know. This one coming in from Coffee Mom says anyone, if they're quoting, I don't know what verse, I, they say anyone who beats their slave with a rod must be punished if the slave dies as a result, but they are not to be punished if the slave recovers after a day or two since the slave is their property. I think she uh, wanted to know what you thought of that. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, again, I will appeal to Dr. Josh's book. It's one of the verses in the book that he says atheists go too far with. Because when he cites Milgram and some of these other people who talk about this passage, what they happen to say is, oh, this isn't at all what you think it is, where it's saying you can beat slaves as long as they don't die. 
He's saying that's too extreme. And instead, what he's saying is, look, this was about moderate correction. In fact, he was asked on a podcast about it, and he says, yeah, it's about like how they beat their children. And then somebody said, yeah, but it's more than them beating their children, right? This is – they beat them more. And he goes, no, it's the same for the children and for them. It's correction. And that's why it says if you put out an eye or a tooth, they're to go free because that means you're hitting them in the head. That is not a spanking. That is not what the you know the Buddhist monks do, where somebody falls out of line training and like you know tries to run off and, and get to town or something. Like yeah, of course that about spanking is you, barbaric. You you can torture them, but you can't kill them or or um, disable them by putting out an eye or a tooth. Yeah, because that just means that you you are swinging at their head. That's not correction. That's actually trying to injure somebody. Of course, beating them with a stick isn't really correction either. But well, it's the same as grandma's. Yeah, it's the same as grandma's. I agree with you that that type of correction is not uh, the best. You know, but I but I'm saying that the same way. Be nice if the Bible gave us the best something that actually would be correction. Look, as I pointed out in the in the presentation that God kept conceding ground. He gave them plants to eat, okay? You don't have to kill animals to eat, but then he conceded meat to them. And so you don't need a king. God's your king. But then he conceded to them, okay, you want to be enslaved by a king? Then take a king, okay? Some of this stuff he's just giving you over to it. But when he's asked about something like Zelophehad's daughters inheriting their father's property when they're like, what, women? He, God goes, yeah, she's saying the right thing, and you should do that, for example. Eddie Dean says, Converse, there are plenty of books by credible authors that say that the Bible is pro-slavery. Have you read any of those? Knowing the counter arguments is important, right? Yeah, he's exactly right. And let me just be clear here and point out for sure that there are a lot of people in the literature that's just going to say, I'm wrong, okay? And they're going to say some people will take a position like this, some people are going to take a position like that. That's fine. There are credible scholars who say there is shadow slavery, but that this verse, for example, Leviticus chapter 5, they're going to say that still is outlawing it amongst citizens. It's just saying that um, it, they don't go as far as saying it's outlawing it for foreigners. So there are some, you know, a lot of scholars that say that, for example. So yeah, I have read the, the other arguments. The issue is that when you read the literature, you're going to see that some – it depends on how closely you relate it to the ancient world, the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, and so forth, and then how closely you think – or how far away you think the Bible is because the Bible uh, it portrays itself as being stay away from what the nations do, right? You're going to be different, different people, one law for the foreigner and for the citizen and so forth, right? So it's, it's portraying itself as trying to get rid of some of the other stuff and regulate – but there are some things that are very close, for example. I want to quick squeeze this one in as we're already just two minutes past, but I do want to read at least one quick standard question. Bertie Numbnuts had asked way earlier in the debate. He said, question, Converse, is this Leviticus passage anti-slavery where it says your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you, from them you may buy slaves? Yeah, so that's the verse we've been talking about. And the reason why I did the whole thing that I said that atheists will say is irrelevant with Ruth and all those types of things, right, is specifically because of this is the one passage really that's used um, about foreigners being different from you know citizens and so forth. But the problem is, like I said, when you read the literature, they're saying this is unique in the ancient world. Okay, this is outlawing abolishing slavery for citizens you can no longer own citizens because god gave them an inherited property but for uh, foreigners can can be um can go into these people's households and be passed down with the household as ruth was when the person uh, who is the guardian redeemer as Christ is our redeemer. He went and he asked that guardian redeemer, uh, will you take, will you um, redeem her inherited property? And he says, yes. But then he says, but Ruth, the foreign Moabite is, comes with it. And he goes, well, then I'm not going to do it because it'll put my own inheritance. There. He's going to have to take on somebody to take care of and so forth. So yeah, you could disagree if you like, it's fine. This is it for our q and a want to say a quick a couple of quick housekeeping things birdie numb nuts my pleasure in reading your question thanks for submitting and want to say my dear friends as you saw at the bottom right of the screen 
DebateCon 3.1 is only three weeks away, and it's coming fast, folks. That's pretty quick. That snuck up on me, so I do want to say, hey, check out the links in the description, both for the in-person tickets if you're near Fort Worth, Texas, on April 22nd. That's Saturday, April 22nd. Hey, if maybe you're far away, the crowdfund link helps us cover the cost of the venue for these debates for this conference. If you throw a buck into the crowdfund, you watch the entire conference for free, live from home. It's, it's an event you don't want to miss out on. We're pumped about it. And as I had shown you earlier in the debate, if you didn't know, if you've had your ears plugged with your fingers and you've been living in a cave on Mars, RN Raw and T Jump are going to have a fun debate on whether or not religion does more harm than good. You don't want to miss it. It's going to be lively. It's going to be fun. And I'm sure there will be a cordial handshake afterwards. I want to say thanks to our guests, Aaron and Converse. It's been a true pleasure to have you tonight. Thanks for having me. Good talking to you guys. Nice to meet you, Aaron. Thanks, folks. Stick around. I'll give you more updates. Those links, as I mentioned, for the conference are in the description box. Check them out while you're waiting, and I'll be back in about 60, well, maybe even 20 seconds to share about upcoming debates here at Modern Day Debate. So stick around. Amazing. My dear friends, I want to say thanks so much for being here. We hope you feel welcome no matter what walk of life you are from. I am absolutely thrilled. I have told you before, and I'll tell you again, we love these in-person conferences. Seriously, it's a total blast. We are really excited about this. We want to encourage you, hey, you better show up for this one. It's going to be huge. If you live in, I would say, anywhere near Fort Worth, Texas, my dear friends, you don't want to miss this one. It's going to be a blast, and it is on Saturday, April 22nd. I'm going to put that link <clears throat> in the live chat. Because one, there's that in-person tickets link in the description box. I'm going to double check that that works right now. Yep, still works. That's great. Sometimes those like tiny URL little tricks, they only work temporarily. I don't know why that is. It's weird, isn't it? But also, I'm going to put this in the live chat. The link to the crowdfund for this upcoming debate to watch all the debates live is here. Okay, so we are pumped about that. My dear friends, you don't want to miss this. It's going to be huge. We're really excited about it. We want to say, if you didn't know about this, let me give you a quick walkthrough because you guys, I'm pumped about this. And you might be thinking like, James, what is all this like debate con stuff? Like, what are you even talking about, man? Well, let me show you. As you can see on the screen right now, debate con 3.1 is our third conference in... Fort Worth, Texas, on Saturday, April 22nd. Links for this are in the description box. Check them out right now. I mean, hey, you guys, this is going to be a lot of fun. These conferences have been, a lot of people have told me, they're like, they, those are a blast. Like, I really enjoy those. And so we're excited about that. But let me show you more about this conference. Whew. Actually, I'm going to load in a quick little picture here, a little window capture of myself so that you can still see my excitement as I go through all these details. So... In particular, here I am. All right, let me show you these, you guys. You might be thinking, James, what exactly is DebateCon? I'm confused. Well, as you can see on the screen, these are the debates that are going to be at DebateCon. Right there, see, like pointing up there, is one, David Wood versus Kenny Bomer on whether or not Muhammad's marriage to Aisha was ethical. It's going to be controversial. We are going to trigger the YouTube terms of service good and hard you don't want to miss it it's going to be a controversial lively debate my dear friends not only that as i have mentioned atheist versus atheist rn raw and tom jump are going to have a friendly debate on whether or not religion does more good than harm you don't want to miss it it's going to be huge but let me show you more oh i've got to update that picture there it still ha it doesn't have hussein's new picture so hussein is not pictured there, you still instead see a silhouette. That's the third debate. Matt Dillahunty will be debating Hussein Embers. And whether or not Islam is true, we're excited about that one. It's going to be a good one. My dear friends, we're pumped about this lineup. The next one is on the far right. Mike Jones versus Daniel Hakikachu. This is going to be huge. My dear friends, I've got to tell you. I've got to say... Maybe I'm partial because, you know, I get along both uh, with Mike and Daniel. 
But I think that these are two of the best debaters. I would say, frankly, I think maybe the best debater from each side. In particular, Mike Jones from the Christian perspective and Daniel Hakikachu. They are going to collide. It's going to be the immovable object against the unstoppable force. This is going to be gigantic. You guys were really excited about this. This conference is going to be so fun. But you might be wondering, you're like, James, I, but you're talking about all these links and stuff, and it's confusing, and you're like, how, to, what, how does this work exactly? Well, let me show you. So DebateCon 3.1, as you see on screen, is going to be all religion and atheism debates. We do have conferences. We've done it before where we had political debates. We will still do those. But this one, we said, hey, let's just do purely religion debates. It's going to be huge. We're excited about it. You don't want to miss it. You can see on screen, this is the Eventbrite page. So Eventbrite is just like a third party kind of website. If you're unfamiliar with it, you're like, oh, what is Eventbrite? That is tagged in the description box where it says, or get your in-person tickets here. Eventbrite, it's got that orange branding. Very convenient, very user-friendly in, in terms of buying tickets for events, as well as maybe you're like, well, James, you know, I, I listen from England. We have a, actually, I've looked at the Modern Day Debates statistics. The city with the most views for Modern Day Debate was not New York City in the last 28 days. It was not Los Angeles. It wasn't Chicago. It was London, which is crazy. I was like, wow, that's cool. Because first, I've been to London and I loved it so much. And I got to go just, just out on the outskirts of London. I got to see Stonehenge, which was like, I want to see that since I was a kid. In like third grade, I was always wanting to see that. So anyway, let's say you're like, or Skeptic77, thanks for being with us. I see you there in the, li the live chat. It says, listening from Bamut. Am I saying it right? Let me know. I'm trying my best, but I don't even, let me find out where Bummit is. Maps, two seconds. Is my dear friends, maybe you're listening from Bummit or maybe England. I've got to figure out where Bummit. Ukraine, wow, that's even further. Well, we hope you're doing well. We hope you're doing, we hope you're safe. We hope you're, uh, we, we appreciate you watching with us and we hope you're, hope you and your, your family is safe and your friends as well. And I've got to tell you, we've also, I've, or I should say, I've, I've looked at the stats. I've seen people watching from another one, Canada. There are a lot of people watching from Canada, Australia. Obviously, these are primarily English-speaking countries, so that makes sense. And the U.S. is actually the biggest in terms of viewers. But I, I was like, wow, when I saw London, in terms of any given city, London is actually where the most views were coming from. I was like, wow, that is, that's great. I was like, wow, that's cool. So I want to say, though, maybe you're in London. Maybe you're in Bamut or Ukraine or Canada, Australia, and you're like, James, I, like, I can't make it in person. One cool thing is, if you don't have plans for Saturday, April 22nd, you do now. Because this is a conference you can watch it from home live. You guys, I mean, that's awesome. That's so fun. Now, the debates will be free to the public afterwards. But I mean, come on, for a buck, I mean, to go to the conference, like loosely speaking, you can watch these debates live for just a dollar and it helps us cover the cost of the venue because for us i gotta be answer i gotta be honest like we financially we're basically breaking even on average and your support through these crowd funds helps if we do get into the green and by into the green i mean if there are any extra funds left we're reinvesting them into the next conference so in other words like if you donate a dollar to watch all these debates live which i'm like hey well, like I mean, for me, I'm very, like, I'm a frugal guy. I'm like, ah, you know, like, I'm pretty frugal. If I put a dollar into something like this, and then I was like, oh, yeah, I forgot about the conference. I was, you know, I was traveling or whatever. I'd be like, ah, it's a dollar. Like, whatever. I'm not worried about it. As I got to say, for just a buck, like, eh, watch it live. You got something fun to do that day. You have got debate con to watch. So we're excited about that. Indiegogo, though, as you might be wondering, why is this pink Indiegogo thing there, is... The crowdfund app, or I should say website, it's, again, a third party that basically their website helps us do these kind of donor tiers. Because you might be like, well, James, I'm like, what have you got in terms of like, what do you mean like by donor tiers? Well, the cool thing is Indiegogo, by, as a quick note, 
it's super easy to sign in because you might be like, well, James, like I'm not familiar with Indiegogo. I've never used it before. I'm kind of uncomfortable with new stuff like that. Well, let me show you this. As you can see on screen, Indiegogo lets you sign in with Facebook. You don't even have to create an account. Like, don't you like that? I use that oftentimes where you can just click like sign in via Facebook. You don't even have to fill in your information. You just, boom, it's an expedited breeze through type of process. You just whew, right through, you throw a buck in, it's that easy. So highly encourage you, it's a piece of cake to sign into Indiegogo if you use Facebook or if you wanna use you know, use your email, if you wanna create an account, go for it. I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff on Indiegogo, not just modern day debate. So it is cool to know about. But you might be wondering like, James, okay, cool, good to know. But what about these perks? Like you mentioned these perks, James. Well, let me show you some of these perks because we've got a number of new ones. So as you can see at the top of the screen, it says watch the entire conference live for a buck. Many hands make light work. And by that, what I mean is, like I said, it, you know, it's pricey for us to get the venue and we appreciate your help. A lot of people have been generous in the past and we appreciate that. Whether you put in a buck or maybe you're like, well, hey, you know, I'm willing to give more than a buck. Like I love Modern Day Debate. Like I enjoy this channel. That means a lot, seriously. Is for example, the next tier that you see on screen is watch all of the debates live and throw in an extra two bucks that we'll use for advertising this event because we're gonna put YouTube ads out as we really do wanna make sure that people know about this conference. Also though, you can support without a perk. Now, technically, if you put in at the $5 amount, you're still gonna get the link to watch live. So like, if you want, but, but let's say you're like, ah, James, I've gotta work that day, but I wanna support it. And yeah, sure, let me throw in five bucks. We appreciate that. The embroidered postcard is the next tier. So if you give 10 bucks, if you're like, hey man, yeah, I wanna, wanna help you guys cover the cost of the venue, cover the cost of, you know, we're flying in speakers too. So that means that, yeah, we're, you know, we're covering a lot of, a lot of airfare is we are covering speakers flights. We are covering the hotel rooms and thanks very much. I see you there in the live chat. God guy says, thanks, James. Thanks very much for your support. Appreciate that brother. Glad you're here with us. And not only that, but like I said, in terms of these perks, your support really does mean a lot. 10 bucks, we send you an embroidered postcard. In other words, we send you a postcard with the modern day debate emblem embroidered into the card. So in other words, like not stamped like an ink stamp, but like stamped in the sense of like, it's like pressed into the paper. It's pretty cool. I've, I bought like this little embroiderer thing, but not only that, you're like, well, James, like I, uh, you know, maybe I'll throw in more than that. If you throw in 25 bucks, your name will be in the credits. So what we do is we have at the end of the debate, we're going to have credits that say, hey, huge thank you to those who have put in $25 to make this debate possible. So that'll be at the end of the debate where we'll say, hey, thank you so much for all of your support. It means more than you know. And not only that, signed emblem from all debaters is the next tier. So in other words, you might be wondering, James, what exactly is a signed emblem? What we mean by this is it'll be a modern day debate emblem. And I'll show you a picture of it where it'll have the emblem from debate con. So you see our little logo there, the podium from the MDD, and then it says debate con, and then it'll have signatures from all of the speakers, just like what you're seeing on screen. It'll be laminated and then we will mail that to you. So signed emblem, that's what we're talking about on screen. You can see like an example of that. Of course, we're not really gonna have, as you can see at the bottom or the top right, it says Aaron Stolze or something like that. It's like it's gonna have names like Matt Dillahunty or Aaron Ra. We're gonna ask the speakers if they'd be willing to sign this. And so that is at the, let me just go back to this new perks page, switching it over. That is at the signed emblem tier which is right around, let me see if I can point to it. Yeah, right here. So you see where my finger is pointing, signed emblem tier. If you throw in 50 bucks, we will send that to you. And not only that, but when you sign up at a certain perk, you get that perk plus all of the perks below it. So in other words, you would get the signed emblem, you get your name in the credits, you would get the embroidered postcard, and you would get to watch all the debates live on the day of the conference. So pretty cool. Also, Next one up is the $60 tier. If you throw in 60 bucks, your question can be read during the debate. I'll give you my email 
you can ask a question during the debate that'll be live and read live. So in other words, I, I keep an eye on my email and I'll just say like, oh, look, Brandon Johnson or Iron Horse or whoever it might be in the live chat. Uh, you know, I'll say they just emailed me this question during the actual debate and then I read it to one of the guests. So it's like you're there. And then the next one is a signed photo of your favorite debater. So that's at the $75 tier. At that point, remember, you would get that bonus. So what we're going to do is we're going to actually take pictures of the debaters during this conference. We've got this like quick little photo taker, like photo printer machine. Chris Gammon bought it. He's figuring out how to like work it. And I'm super grateful. We have volunteers like Chris and Bob and others that are going to be at this conference because I could never do it my, like I could never do this myself. Myself. Chris already bought it. We're going to take the picture right then and there during the conference. We're going to ask the speaker to sign it. And then we're going to mail it to you as our thank you for joining us at this $75 tier. So really cool. I've already seen somebody sign up for that. But not only that, if you sign up for that, remember you get all of the perks below that too. So you get to ask a question during the Q&A live. You get the signed emblem with all the speaker signatures like R&R, Ra, Matt Delonte, and so on. And... Last but not least, if you throw in $100, it's a one-on-one -on -one Zoom chat with me. I will give you all of the secrets of modern day debate. We don't have any secrets. So like, I'm willing to tell you, if you're like, James, well, what kind of software do you use? Like, how do you do this stuff? Like, can I do my own channel like this? Yeah, like, I'll, I'll tell you the truth. Like, I'll tell you how we do it. And if you're like, James, like, train me on the software in that hour. Like, okay, well, like, I'll train you on the software. Like, whatever you want. Or maybe you're like, James, I just want to ask questions about what is it in terms of debating? Like, what do you think are the most important things while debating? Because I do think that there are some strategic things that are really important. And having watched about 880 debates now, probably more like 800, to be honest, because we have moderator help, guest mods. So, but, you know, having watched at least 700, very conservative estimate, probably 800 debates. Because I've also watched many, many, many debates before I started Modern Day Debate. I've watched, I would say probably, I would guess, 50 professional level debates some of which were in person, maybe like five or six, some of which I even hosted, like I, I put them on. But I wanna say, my dear friends, I wanna say thank you for your support. These perks are amazing. But you might be wondering, you're like, James, I had like, okay, I got the perks idea, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, you know, what is this for again? For DebateCon 3.1 by Modern Day Debate, this is our conference and it is going to be amazing. You don't want to miss it, my dear friends. And we've had successful crowdfunds before. So if you're kind of like, hey, I, I, like I've never seen a crowdfund before. What, have you guys ever done this? We have had many past success, past success, past successful crowdfunds. So we want to say we're excited about this. This conference is undoubtedly happening. Happening. We are determined to make it happening. I want to say thank you guys for all of your support, though. I haven't even gotten to say hi to you in the live chat, so I want to say hello. Logan Fisher, good to have you here, as well as Brandon Johnson. Thanks for dropping in. Troll, I see you there. What? I, I see you there in the live chat again. Good to have you. As well as B, uh, DJ Batman says, I look forward to chatting with you, James. DJ, I thought I saw that. Indiegogo, let me check this out. I could have sworn I saw you in the list of people who had donated, and in particular at the Zoom chat with James Level. Let me check this out. But I want to say, DJ Batman, thanks for being a moderator. Thanks for being a supporter of Modern Day Debate. Seriously, it means more than you know. And I'm excited, though. You guys, this is really cool. Holy smokes. The crowdfund is doing really well. So this is like, to be three weeks out, <clears throat> I want to show you guys this. I should, I got to put it up in a, let me pull this up. I know it always, it makes Zoom slow down. I hate doing this. Uh, or I should say it makes OBS slow down. But I got to show you this because I'm encouraged. We've had 45 backers. So you guys, that's for, for this far out, for how far we are from um, the actual conference. Like, I'm like, hey, that, that's really good. Like actually, that's, that's fantastic. So we are really excited about that. My dear friends, you do want to check this out. Let me show you DebateCon 3.1. I'll show it to you on screen. If it is, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If OBS is slowing down, if it's starting to get all funky on me, bear with me. But I'm going to show you this really quick. Window capture, window eight, too many windows. So let me show you this one because you're like, James, what are you talking about? Are you high? No. Let me pull this up. High on life. 
Let me pull this up. Where? Wait a minute. Where? Okay. Two seconds. It's close. It's coming. Two seconds. There it is. All right. Now we're all right. Now we're rolling. We're rocking and rolling. So, <clears throat> as you can see, I'm pumped. 45 backers. The 20 days left. We're in a good. Like that's a good pace. We've done plenty of these before, so I know usually most donations do come in last week. But like, so to have 45 backers, 45 donations, and to have raised 824, that's huge. So we do appreciate that support. Seriously, are you guys able to see that? Let me see if you're able to see. Yeah, you can see it pretty well. So that's awesome, though. And I'll even show you guys the video. I love this video. So it's really cool. And I'm not going to play it because if I play it, I get struck with a, a copyright thing. But you can see it at least. So doesn't that look awesome? I love that video. That we got to put promo videos out because the conference is coming up fast. But Iron Horse, good to see you. Surgeon General says, as long as you're fine with me donating the Zoom call to someone else who donates Modern Day Debate. That's really kind of you, Surgeon General. Seriously, it means a lot. It really does. And I am totally comfortable with that. Whoever you want to set me up with on this blind date. Beheaded. Where did I see? Behead. Beheaded. From Australia, beheaded kamikaze. We're glad you're here. Thanks for coming by. Says that might be called embossed. Embroidery is art made by sewing, stitching. You're right. <laughs> you're right. I've been saying it wrong this whole time. Let me like look it up really quick. Define embroidered. Let me pull it up for you guys too, and then you guys can see what embroidered actually is. Because you're right. I think it is like sewing with beads, right? Of cloth decorated with patterns. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, I can't do that. I'm not going to be able to do a postcard like this. That, I wish. I mean, like, that's cool. It does look, you know, it looks a lot better than the postcard I'm sending. But I, unfortunately, yeah, you're right. It's embossed is what I meant to say. So, my dear friends, I want to say thanks for, thanks for that feedback. That's funny. As well as JRRT, Token King. Thanks for dropping by. See you there in the old live chat. And I've got to say, my dear friends, thanks for all your support. Thanks for your love. You guys make this channel fun, seriously. And Boss, that's right. Thank you for that. Uh, Antifa86i, thanks for coming by. So, so the debate is over. That's right. Now you get to see, look at embroidery with me. I mean, pretty cool still. This one from App Gaming coming by. Thanks for dropping in. As well as living room speakers. Good to see you again. Boggle Run app. Thanks for coming by. Logan Fisher, I see you there in the chat. Thanks for being with us. True Tech, glad you're here. Sam Shrew, thanks for dropping in. As well as Flum666 and Canon Carol. Thanks for being here. EJZ, thanks for coming by. I see you there in the live chat. And I want to say thank you guys for being subscribers. Seriously. We appreciate it. And by the way, you guys... Oh my gosh. Well, first, if you're in the live chat, I know you're a subscriber. So I want to say thank you guys. I see you there. Master Optics, thanks for being a subscriber. Seriously, that means a lot. We do appreciate you guys supporting us. Frankly, it's not like anybody else knows who subscribed. But what it's true. There is something to the idea. The old, it's kind of like an old marketing idea that when people see a lot of people subscribe to something, people tend to think like, mm, there's probably something to that. Like there's probably something enjoyable about it. So it does give us social credibility. We'd appreciate your support for that. And I want to say true tech. Good to see you there in the old live chat. Sideshow Nav, good to see you. You guys can meet Sideshow Nav in person at this conference. Seriously. Do you guys want to meet Sideshow Nav? For real. It'd be pretty cool. He's the real Sideshow Nav. Not like one of those imposter accounts. The real one. Lone Drow says, Hi, James. Love the channel and all the juicy debates. Thanks for your kind words. Thanks for your support. That means more than you know. I love doing this channel. I love Modern Day Debate. It is so fun for me. I plan on doing it the rest of my life. Like I, I just really enjoy it. So for me, it is a blast. Spooky McGee, thanks for coming by. Says, Wow, just started watching the Q&A. Thanks for coming by, Spooky. If you ever hear this. The Sinister Porpoise, good to have you back. I see you there. But I've got to say, my dear friends, I should get out of here pretty soon. It's getting a little late, and I want to get a decent night of sleep. So for me, it's 8.30. I'm in mountain time. But want to say, my dear friends, thanks for all of your support. <sighs> Let me take a deep breath. Tell me how you're doing. In the live chat, can you tell me what's new? 
What you what you have on your mind? What you're thinking about? I'm gonna pop my pills really quick. I take some sleepy pills. You guys do like the valerian root? Gives you some like funky dreams. It's great. Oh, I got. I'm pumped about this valerian root all the way. That embroidery is beautiful, isn't it? Have you guys even been paying attention to the embroidery? But I want to say thank you guys for your support. And appreciate your love. DJ Batman says, everyone share this channel. Let's break 100,000. It is crazy. Thank you guys for your support. Appreciate your kind words. What says Modern Day Debate is number one. Thanks for that. Certain General says almost 100,000 subscribers. It is true. It's crazy. I never thought that Modern Day Debate would be that it would grow like this. It's crazy. So we're excited. We're really excited. I want to say thank you guys for your support. This is just the beginning of our story. Our vision is to provide a neutral platform so that everybody can make their case on a level playing field. That's what's important to us. That's what we're determined to do. And our values are clear and we stick to them. In particular, we believe in fairness, of course, because it's a neutral platform. We want everybody to have their fair shot to make their case on a level playing field. But second of all, it's about freedom. Our guests were free from their first breath. We want to keep it that way. We want them to be able to make their case. They might have outlandish views. They might have controversial views. They might have views that trigger you big time. I can tell you, there are views that I've hosted on this channel that I don't know if I'd say triggered, but I've been like, wow, this is pretty controversial. I can tell you that. But nonetheless, if we're really going to be neutral, like, we're really going to be neutral. We're going to be neutral with everybody. Like, we're actually going to give everybody a fair shot. And that leads to our third value. Let me get more water. And then let me keep you on a cliffhanger here. And I'm going to tell you our third value and why it's important to us. Let me get a little bit more of that sleepy pill. I take a lot of sleepy pills. I'm just wound up. I'm geared up. I don't slow down easily. So these, like, basically help me to, like, slow down and not be all excited. Because I'm always, like, I want to go, you know? Like, I'm like, hey, I want to go grab the world by the tail. Two seconds. I got to get my water. Okay, I'm back. Mm. The screen looks so nice with that embroidery. It doesn't look as like austere as usual. Trip Fontaine, I see you there in the old live chat. Thanks for coming by. Trip Fontaine says, serious question, would you have hosted a debate between H I T L E R and those who disagreed on whether or not his actions were moral. Of course we would have. Trip Fontaine is like, oh, that's bad. And we'd say the reason that we would is I would say Trip Fontaine, do you think that H-I-T-L-E-R had better arguments than his critics? Well, presumably not. I mean, I hope not. Because I at least, I mean, maybe we differ. I would say I think that his critics who oppose what he did in the year of 19, well, the years of 1939 through 44, if I remember right, is it 44 or 45? I should know this. I would say, of course, that his critics have better arguments. And you say, well, why is that important? Well, when we platform someone and their bad arguments are exposed, that's a good thing. And that actually leads to our last value. In particular, competition is our last value. Because we say, hey, we're all about fairness. We're all about freedom that people can say what they want. Then the last one is competition is a good thing. And the reason is, is it leads to a natural selection of ideas. In other words, 
when you let a thousand flowers bloom, when you let the chips fall where they may, the best arguments are going to win out in the marketplace of ideas. That's what the research says. So a lot of people are like, oh, James, no. But I, even though I think that critics of H-I-T-L-E-R have better arguments than him, sometimes they might still win the debate, and that's bad because maybe they're more charismatic or better looking or funnier or whatever it might be, and, and that might kind of like win people over to them. They might win the debate that way. Well, I can tell you, People make all sorts of claims. They say, James, you don't know it's bad by hosting them. And I say, hey, my argument is this. The research is clear. Petty and Cassiopo, this is a theory with mountains of evidence behind it. Petty and Cassiopo, 1986, said that. It's called the elaboration likelihood model. Says that the central route of persuasion, namely evidence and logical reasoning, is more persuasive than peripheral routes of persuasion such as the attractiveness of the speaker or how funny they are and so the empirical research says that i'm right that it's actually good when we host those debates because we do match those people up with competent critics or opponents and they bring these arguments and then people are you could say inoculated against these bad ideas in other words like they've got a small little bit of exposure to it and they also saw it rebutted that's a good thing. And so when I see critics and they're like, no, James, it's bad. And here's why. I always say, hey, listen, I, I appreciate you saying that. But it's just assertions. They're just making baseless assertions. I'm like, hey, great. Love to hear your opinion. I'm willing to listen all day. But it's all it is. It's just an opinion. It's really sad that a lot of these people come in. And I'm not saying this about you, friend, in the live chat, Trip Fontaine. I'm not trying to throw you under the bus. But a lot of people come in and they make these assertions. And they're like, no, it's bad. And they're like, so it's not good to always be neutral. And I say, well, the empirical evidence is on my side. And they say, then they give, you know, they give claims and objections that, again, don't cite empirical evidence. And I say, hey, listen, like, your opinions are cool. But for me, scientific research, scientific evidence trumps your opinion. So it's like, cool, but you're coming into this and you're looking like, I hate to throw, uh, <clears throat> I would say that, so they say, I think that's naive to say that happens in reality. People are dumb. I'd say, hey, that's what the research shows. So you might say, well, people are dumb. And it's like, well, the research shows that actually people are more persuaded. So you might think that they're dumb and you might think that you're smarter than them. Because that's the thing is I always find these people are like, well, I wouldn't fall for it. But it's all those other people that will. And I'm like, well, I mean, the elaboration likelihood model doesn't make any distinction where it says like, oh, but dumb people. So I would say, hey, you can say, well, I think there's an exception. And I'd say, hey, great. I brought empirical papers. You didn't. And it just shows that like you're, you're basically going based on assertions and your, your bias. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to be mean, but that's just what I would say to my critics because a lot of people say like, oh, and and they never would admit it. They'll never like sit back and think to themselves like, oh, yeah, like I am just kind of like giving like objections, but I don't have any empirical papers or research that I can cite. It's all just my opinions on this. And the craziest thing, too, is a lot of them have like really strong opinions on it. So they're like, oh, like I made up my mind. And so like they're ready to like keep digging in and pushing in. And I'm like, okay, I mean, like, I maybe point, for example, there's other research, like empirical papers on, I mentioned during the debate, the randomized control trials on the evidence for debates changing people's minds. And a lot of them, again, I was just like, I say, like, hey, you know, like, really, I mean this with love to all my critics who are like, no, I, I disagree, James. I'm like, would you really just seriously consider? I'm not trying to be mean. Uh, I'm just saying, would you consider that, like, Maybe you're coming into this with a bias from your in-group. Because a lot of people, they, they take the views that they hear from their in-group on Twitter or YouTube or whatever it is, and they're not, based by, they're not based on empirical research most of the time. And I, and I say, especially because I, like, when I ask them, I'm like, well, why, why wouldn't you just, well, why wouldn't you give some like, you know, research for it if you've got that? Like... I guess for me, that's I just value empirical research more than 
you know, I can give my, but you can say this, I can say that it's like, okay, great. But what's the tiebreaker? Well, it's empirical research. So I want to say though, we appreciate you guys for all of your support and trip Fontaine. I hope I wasn't too hard on you. Like, like I said, some of the stuff that I was addressing, in fact, I'd say most of it, cause you've come in and you've objected and that's fair. It's a debate channel. So I want to encourage that, but I do just, Sometimes I have come, people come in and they already made up their mind. And they're, they're and I'm not saying this is you. I'm saying you're different trip. So I don't want to throw you under the bus. I'm not trying to do that. But I do sometimes have once in a while people come in. And they're just like, they were like, you know, they'll, they'll have like a really like decided opinion on this. I'm like, well, it's like, okay. <laughs> I had a cold like a month ago and I still have a cough from it. But I want to say thank you guys for your support. We're excited about the future. I want to say I love you. You guys mean a lot. And in the marketplace of ideas, we are excited because we believe, as I mentioned, that the cream will rise to the top. The best arguments will win out. There will be a natural selection of ideas, and the best ideas are going to win. Believe me. You know it. I know it. Everybody knows it. I want to say thanks for your support. I love you guys. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable. We will see you next time. And, oh, wait, I was going to mention that. If you haven't already, it means a lot. Pull out your favorite podcast app. Find Modern Day Debate. Follow us. You can listen to debates on the go. It's ad-free. It's music-free. And maybe you already are. Maybe you're like, oh, yeah, I already actually do follow Modern Day Debate on my favorite podcast app. And say, hey, will you do us a favor and rate us? Like, that really does mean a lot. So maybe you're already on your phone, and if you pull up your favorite podcast app right now, like I will do. Let me find this here. Podcast Addict. I think I still have it downloaded on like 99. There it is. Is you can find that right now if you type in Modern Day Debate. You will find us and you can listen to debates on the go. I want to say thanks for all of your support. We want to keep the marketplace of ideas as accessible as possible, whether it be here on YouTube or via podcast. Thanks for your support. I love you guys. Keep sifting out the reasonable from the unreasonable and we'll see you next time.